What is going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of Faith Unaltered. I'm your host, Tyler Fowler. With me is my good buddy, Joshua Davidson. How are you doing today, sir? I am doing quite well. I got the opportunity to sleep in until almost eight o'clock, which is just <laughs> a miracle from the Lord in my life. Uh, so I'm having a I'm having a good Monday, man. Right on. I'm having a really good Monday. My daughter is adorable and just went to school, and it's quiet in my house for a moment. It's going to be a good time. It's funny. Your daughter, my daughter gets home from school as your daughter goes to school. So that time <laughs> shift is, is ridiculous. But we've got a panel uh, of Orthodox gentlemen on with us today to talk about normative authority, apostolic succession. I have looked and looked and tried to find videos on YouTube that deal with this topic directly. And I've had a, I'm not saying there's not any there, but I've had a hard time finding them. And so listening to a lot of Jay's stuff uh, over the past couple of months, really helping me uh, come to, you know, orthodoxy. Father Jonathan Ivanov has helped me as well in, in our personal exchanges, uh, whether off of air or on air. And I am happy to say that I've got my baptism date already, and that is going to be Lazarus Saturday of next year. And so I'm happy to say that I'm going uh, since, since because, you know, talking to y'all uh, and, and just the things that, you know, I was questioning beforehand, all three of you have had a part in really helping me, uh, secure, uh, that belief in the Orthodox faith. And I talked to my past or my priest, uh, father Daniel, uh, recently and our whole family, uh, we're, we're expecting a little girl on January the 1st or I'm sorry, January the 16th. And then after that, uh, a couple months after that, we'll all be baptized uh, together into the Orthodox Church. And so, again, a big thank you for all three of you because you all three have had a part in that. And so I'm excited to have you all three together uh, to talk about this uh, this concept, normative authority, apostolic succession. Like I said, I've heard Jay talk about it. And uh, I feel like we can just jump into this. All three of you have been on the show before, uh, so people know who you are. Um, but let, let me just get this out of the way, and, and then we can really dive in. But I feel like whenever we have a discussion on normative authority with those that disagree with the Eastern Orthodox understanding of the subject, the place to start is defining what we mean by normative authority and building a case for apostolic succession using scripture, using what the early church fathers have to, or seeing what the early church fathers have to say about this. And as I found, there's a plethora of information just in the apostolic fathers. Uh, that talk about the subject, especially uh, apostolic succession. But I invited you gentlemen on to tell me your person or how you personally handle this topic and in your discussions of normative authority. So let's start with Jay. Can you define for me what it is exactly what you mean by normative authority and where do you begin uh, when this topic is brought up either by you or somebody that you're talking to? How do you address the subject? Well, normativity has to do with what we ought to do. So it's a question of ethics. It's a question of um, what types of things, uh, rather than stating what is the case, we're saying what you ought to do. And so the idea here is more than just um, good and bad, but but rather are we bound by or, or can we bind uh, people in this case, in terms of the church to certain interpretations and can the conscience be bound by things? And I say that because it's a distinction from when people ask the question of, well, how does an individual know, you know, whether the, the Bible is true or what canon is true or orthodoxy versus Roman Catholicism or Protestantism? And a lot of times these things get confused because right. although they're related, the question of individual certainty or what we might say is existential certainty. It's a, it's different from the question of whether there's any body of people within history that has authority to bind people to an interpretation. And I think one reason that this gets confused is that in a lot of Roman Catholic apologetics, you'll see them kind of conflate the two and they'll, they'll say, well, if you don't have the Pope, then you can't know the Bible or you can't know uh, what's heresy or, you know, this or that. And it, and Protestants, I think, rightly respond to that Roman Catholic critique by saying, well, but at the end of the day, as a Roman Catholic, you also believe that the Holy Spirit is the final guide and, you know, arbiter of what's true and false. So we're kind of in the same boat. And mm -hmm. 
when I was a Protestant looking at Roman Catholics, I would notice that you know, the response was typically to just kind of kick the can down the road and say, well, uh, yeah, but, but we got the Pope. Yeah, but you still got to interpret what the Pope says. You still got to interpret the, you know, massive amounts of papal writings and you got to try to figure out which ones are magisterium and which ones aren't. And so I think that it helps to delineate two different categories within philosophy of, you know, making that comparison to, and I'll, I'll hush after this, but making the comparison <laughs> to the, the difference between an individual uh, coming to figure out what's true and false versus the question of, say, the Constitution as a written document, <clears throat> and is there a body of people that have the authority to interpret it and legislate on the basis of that, right, like the Supreme Court? So what we're talking about here is, can everybody go and read the Constitution and can they figure out true things? Yeah, absolutely. That's the question of individual relationship to the text or to the Bible or whatever. But that's a different question from normativity, which is whether there's a body of people that Christ endowed with any kind of authority to to rule on matters. And we know in the Old Testament, we already had that with the Levitical structure. You know, Moses was there having to kind of make judgments and there was too many cases for him to rule on on the basis of the law. And so he appointed elders and he laid his hands on people to give that spirit to them to have the authority to also make these kinds of judgments. So in the Old Testament, you see a pattern there of not just Moses laying on hands to establish kind of courts mm -hmm. uh, and a, a, an appellate court structure, but also the biological descent of the lineal descent of right of the uh, the Levites, Levitical priesthood. That becomes kind of the paradigm model that both of these things are fused in the New Testament to where you get a spiritual descent. Uh, of the priesthood that's a kind of a succession that passes on the body of doctrines that has hands laid on, which is seen to be an actual sacrament versus, <clears throat> excuse me, and that, and that also combines the notion of, you know, in the Old Testament, the patriarch lays hands and it passes the promise on. Joseph lays his hands on it, passes the promise on to the promised seed. So all of those laying on of hands in the Old Testament is kind of combined into the New Testament to produce this structure of apostolic succession. Mm -hmm. which, as you pointed out, you see in the post episode Fathers. And then I think what happens in the Reformation is that you get this crisis with the papacy that then leads them to kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater and to say, well, because Pope's corrupt, which he was, now we're going to have to just get rid of all that and say nobody has the authority to bind anyone, anyone's conscience after the apostles. And so now the Protestant is left without any normative authority because again, all the all the classical Reformation, uh, you know, creeds and confessions have this freedom of conscience, freedom of worship, uh, freedom of interpretation kind of clause, right. which uh, removes the possibility of normative authority. Right, and and I, I definitely want to go back to and hit on what you said uh, about Protestants in in my engagements with different Protestants uh, about this idea that there's this blackout. I think you've labeled it as that uh, in some of your previous episodes, but like as a blackout. Kind of like after the apostles, there is, even though Christ delegated his authority to the apostles, that doesn't happen after the apostles. After they die out, it seems that authority kind of died out with them. But I want to get Father John Whiteford and Father Jonathan Ivanoff, your guys' take uh, on how you would define normative authority and where you start really when talking to people about this. Uh, Father John, uh, we'll start with you and then we'll go to Father Jonathan Ivanoff. Um, but is there anything that you would add to what Jay said or, or redefine or, or how would you address this topic? Well, I, I think the way I would explain it is just to talk about how the church is the body of Christ. And so it obviously the church as a whole is infallible because Christ can't have air. And, uh, and and so when we're talking about something the church as a whole has taught, it's authoritative. And how do we know what the church has taught? Well, we have the scriptures. We have the, the ecumenical canons. We also have... Um, things like the liturgical tradition. So when, when we have universally received liturgical text, those are not uh, just optional things. Those are things that you know we believe what we what we pray and we pray what we believe. And so our services teach us the faith. And um, and of course there's also uh, universal practices that we all have in common. Now there's also local practices that 
are not on the same level, which we, you know, they're, they're, they may be good and useful, but they're, they're sort of a, a different, in a different category. Right. And um, <clears throat> in the, in the church today, we obviously have bishops, we have synods, and we have the people. And uh, any individual bishop or even synod could be fallible, but they still have authority because they've been given authority because they are successors of the apostles. But the various bishops sort of keep each other in check. And if one uh, gets off base, then the other ones will start to correct them. And the people also uh, uh are the guardians of piety according to the traditions of the church and so the people can correct the bishops too when the when the uh, situation arises right. so that's that's how we know what the church teaches is, if, is from all these different sources which are really all one source which is the the holy spirit and it and it in it uh, the holy spirit's life in the church what a good example of what yeah you just said about the laity really correcting the bishops. Would a good example of that be like the Council of Florence, uh, or, or or is there another council that you have in mind? That's a good example, but you know you could talk about other examples. You know, often the Orthodox Church has been accused of uh, Caesar Caesaro papism. You know, w mm. because basically the West wants to view everything in the, through the lens of papism, so they try to say, "What kind of papism do you have in the East?" Well, it's the Emperor who's the Pope. Well, if that was true, then we would have embraced iconoclasm because we had iconoclastic emperors that uh, were not just promoting iconoclasm, but but vigorously persecuting people who were venerating icons, but the people rejected that. And um, so, um, you know, it wasn't just the laity, but it was certainly included the laity that re that refused to go along with this. And that's how uh, the, the, the faith survived that onslaught of heresy. Sure. Right on, right on. I, you guys are talking about so much stuff that I want to get to here in a minute. Uh, but let's go to Father Jonathan Ivanov. Uh, same question. How would you define uh, normative authority? Is there anything that you would say different? And what James well, the way I would the way I would talk about it is I would say to someone who, let's say, was inquiring about this, I would say clearly in the church, the place of the scriptures is paramount, followed by the councils and the canons, just kind of like what Father John just said. And then the particular teaching legacy, as I would say, of, of the fathers, most of whose writings, by the way, center on the interpretations of the scriptures. Um, but one of the biggest issues over the centuries has, has always been who is qualified to interpret those scriptures, hmm. which lead to the councils and the canons and all those other decisions and things like that. In the sub-apostolic age, uh, as the apostles began to, to, to pass from the scene, the church moved to a time when, when the written documents of the apostles, I think it's um, Ignatius that calls them the memoirs of the apostles, or that might be St. Justin Martyr, I forget. Um, they became the authoritative source for understanding the way, the faith, the issue became then who should do this. Mm -hmm. And I think that then harkens back to what Paul told Timothy, and this is one of my favorite <laughs> verses on this topic in the whole uh, in the whole Bible, when he said, Tim uh, uh, Timothy, my son, what I have taught you, and, and notice, I, I point this out to Protestants, that he's talking to Timothy, he's not saying uh, Colossians, what I've taught you, Ephesians, what I've taught you, he's saying, Timothy, what I've taught you, teach to other men so that they can teach other men. So you've got Paul, the first generation Christian, talking to Timothy, kind of we could call the second generation Christian, teaching the third, and then the third teaching the fourth generation. So there is this there is this method, you might say, and Jay alluded to it, John, Father John talked about it, where what I know I'm going to give to you through a laying on of hands, and also through this transmission of actual teaching itself. It's not just the laying on of hands. It's not a mechanical transfer of authority from one generation to the next, but it's what I've taught you, that you're going to receive it, you're going to faithfully keep it, and you're going to pass it on. So it's the interpretation of the apostles who themselves claim they were taught by Jesus and who always refer to that. I think only once in his epistles does Paul ever say, this teaching is from me, not from the Lord, but from me. I think he only does that once, and mm -hmm. it's not on a major issue. But it, it's always very clear that t Paul teaching Timothy, teaching the third, teaching the fourth generation is always about that transmission of proper teaching, the proper interpretation of what the Lord himself through the Holy Spirit has taught the, the apostles and whether they're faithfully passing that on. 
Now, there's always the question of how do we know this, but that, that that's sort of a different issue. But I would say the issue has always been who should do this and then, you know, how it's done. St. Paul refers to that to Timothy and so forth. And um, uh, we get to where we are then. And we see that really in the church fathers, especially in the apostolic fathers, they they're really concerned about the teaching. I mean, this starts in uh, 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, and we see this idea of what I have taught you hand down. And the idea that Protestants will say is that, you know, some of the fathers or the majority of the fathers where they agree on a consensus <laughs> whenever it comes to things like apostolic succession, like what we're talking about today, uh, the true presence of Christ uh, in the Eucharist, or the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, uh, baptismal regeneration, they got these things wrong. These are fundamental topics, in my opinion, that I see being talked about in the Father. And to say they got them wrong, I, I don't know what to think of that. I mean, what, what would you, uh, how would you respond to somebody that says that they got these things wrong, these fundamental issues? Well, the, 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 the onus is on them to do that because mm. uh, when, when, you, when, when St. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, uh, <clears throat> what, what I receive from the Lord, I, I'm passing on to you. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and, you know, they're talking about the institution of, of, of the Holy Eucharist and so forth and how to take it seriously and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, that, that verse and that section doesn't stand separate from what Jesus says in John 6. There, there's a cohesive whole to how all of this has to be understood. And the cherry picking and the, and the, and the select verse that, that, that's picked out to refute this, that, or the other thing, and then stands in contrast to something else that says something different is clearly undermining their own argument. Right right on. Now, Josh, I think that you, we, we were talking a little bit earlier uh, off of air, and mm -hmm. you had a question about the East accepting a centralized authority in the church, such as a group, like a council uh, of right. people, but rejecting you know a central individual authoritative figure like the Pope. Uh, did you want to bring that up now? Well, I mean, from what I've heard so far, it seems like there's an implicit answer already in what you guys have said. But I'm kind of want to draw it out more explicitly is that um, it seems to be that let's say there's a like like you said, there's the hand, there's the laying on of hands. There's the passing of authority from one generation to another and even from one individual to another. Um, but it seems like even though for most of let's say mo most human endeavors that involve a communal aspect, there's going to be a figurehead that emerges, but it seems like there's a purposeful resistance in the church of having a singular figurehead that arises, something like a pope, right? Um, and so is that because as an individual, this person is not like, like I think, because because from what I've gathered about what you've said so far, it seems like the issue with authority is that when it's when it's delegated to an individual, then the individual is trying to carry more weight than their let's say their personality can maintain and that person is fallible. And so it needs to be distributed. Am I, am I, am I following? Like, is that, cause there seems to be a, a, like a, like a huge underlying reason why the, the authority is accepted for a church body, but not for a figurehead. Is that something to do specifically with the fallibility of the individual or is that more tied to your Christology? Uh, and that's for any anybody who wants to answer that. It's not a particular. Well, Christ promised the apostles that he would guide them into all truth, but he didn't promise that to any one of them individually. He promised them, that to them as a whole. And uh, because the, the, the church is the body of Christ, it's an organism that uh, has to be in conformity with itself. And if a part of the body becomes egotistical and uh, and starts to stray from what the what the whole teaches. Eventually, gets cut off. And um, but while you while you're still in the body, the the rest of the body corrects it. Just like in your natural bodies, when we have a, a part of the body that's unhealthy, the body's immune system starts to kick in and it heals itself. Uh, so that's basically how things work in the church. So we don't have any one individual who's the big kahuna, but we have lots of individuals who have different degrees of authority that they've been given by virtue of their office. But all the authority that any one of them have is, is always dependent on their fidelity to Christ and to their tradition that's been received. And one of the things a lot of Protestants don't 
understand because of course m- you know most people don't read new testament greek is when uh, christ talks about i receive that which i delivered unto you mm-hmm. delivered is a verbal form of the word tradition and when um saint jude talks about the faith being once delivered unto the saints that's also a verbal form of the word tradition and uh, so they tend to think of tradition only in the negative sense because that's what they've been uh, conditioned to think uh, as they've been taught in their own traditions ironically but uh, uh, but tradition is a good thing if it's if it has the right source the traditions of men are bad <laughs> but traditions that you get from Christ and the apostles are infallible and um, so as long as you're 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 being faithful to what you've been, you've received, then you actually have the authority that comes with your office. But if you depart from that, then you lose that. So then the, the, let's say the, the, cause I, I, I hear what you're saying. And I agree that, that especially as somebody who grew up in, let's say a fundamentalist kind of Baptist style church, I was really always taught that that tradition is a dirty word uh, and, and things like that, that like, I mean, not, not necessarily as explicit as all that, but something, something along those lines is if, you know, if you, if you have a question, you go directly to scripture. If you have a question about scripture, you go directly to the person that is, let's say in charge of where you are locally, there isn't anything outside of the individual localized church body that says, this is what your pastor answers to. And therefore, if the pastor is in some sense it misaligned with something that came before that there's a disconnect and that tradition is like the let's say the 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 plumb line of how you determine those things but um what one thing that was mentioned specifically jay said uh uh used uh, moses as i believe it was jay used moses as an example of a of a figurehead of central authority who then delegated his authority outward and the reason why that's interesting to me is because it seems as though the reason for that delegation was that he himself individually was insufficient for the weight the load that was being placed on him um is is it the case that if moses moses had not delegated that we would see something like the corruption of that individual figurehead um or was this something because it wasn't necessarily a command by god in that that context it was something where he was doing something that was recommended and then he did it of himself it seems like he had the authority to decide oh yeah i'm going to delegate what i've been granted um is that something where do you see what I'm asking? I'm trying. I'm trying to form this on the fly, um, so I, I I might not be wording this all that well, but I'm trying to figure out why Moses as a figurehead is acceptable, but the 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 emergence of something like a pope among the church body would not be. Do you see? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Could I respond? To yeah. That? Absolutely. Yeah. Please. <clears throat> yeah. If you uh, if you think about the time in redemptive history in the old testament you have a lot of types and shadows so a lot of what's happening in the old testament is a pattern for the new right so those different modes of that uh gift or the promise the blessing being passed on whether it's the uh, biological descent of the ironic priesthood or the laying on of hands with moses and joshua whether it's the laying on of hands the promise of the patriarchs these are different things that are kind of fulfilled in our laying on of hands and in our promise in the church. And so Moses has a specific t- typological referent, which the New Testament makes very clear in many, many passages, is fulfilled in Christ. The irony is that a lot of times in Roman Catholic uh, argumentation and apologetics, you'll get this move where they'll, they might admit that there's a reference to Jesus, but Moses becomes a type of the Pope. Uh, Joshua becomes a type of the Pope. So everything becomes papal focused in the apologetic. And actually, you will you notice as well that this line of argumentation is really late in church history. It starts to really be utilized, particularly at the Counter-Reformation period where Jesuits are looking for ways to find and bolster the doctrine of the papacy from the Old Testament through typology. So they say, oh, look, Moses is kind of doing what the Pope does. Look at the high priest in the Old Testament. Well, he's kind of like the Pope. We need one high priest. But this misses the whole purpose and movement of typology to the fulfillment. And so Christ is the high priest, right? Christ is the cornerstone, not the papacy. And so all of these things that were actually Christological become papal logical typologies. And the problem with that is that it's an actually a reversion to an older 
form of relating to God. It's like, it's like kind of like the, it's a reverse move of what Baptists and people do or Calvinists do with the uh, sacraments. They'll say, look, we need to go back to the sacraments of the old Testament when they were just kind of types and signs and symbols, but that's a retrograde movement. That's a, that's a, a backwards movement when the movement is to where the types and symbols become the realities. So the reality of mm -hmm. The presence of Christ amongst the, the people is in the Holy Spirit. So the very office and function of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church is the thing that is then being replaced by the office of the Pope. And I'll end up with this point. It's funny you said that because I was just reading this really good book in the St. Vladimir Seminary Church History set, which is the one that deals with <clears throat> the rise of the papacy at the time of the Gregorian reform. And then it gets into Byzantine history. And so this is Papadakis and Mayendorf together. And in that first uh, chapter, he's going through the, the Gregorian reforms. And it's really this period, which is a huge turn, because as Father John Weifer was saying, you know, a lot of times Roman Catholics will say, well, you guys are, uh, you know, the imperial Cesaro Papist Church. But even Roman Catholic historians like Dvornik or Congar, they're beginning to admit and have been admitting for the, the last century or so that if you look at that 11th, 12th century period, there's a period when you have basically a hundred years of German princes appointing the Pope. <laughs> and so the, the, the reason for the, uh, this, I mean, to, to give some credit to the, to the Roman Catholics at this time period, I don't believe in, in the papal innovations, obviously, but one of the reasons that you get the Gregorian reforms is because the state was trying to control the church. It's called the investiture controversy. Yeah. And so the papacy said, hey, I got a way to solve this. Let's make me the, the top daddy, right? The big kahuna, as Father John Wyvers. And so now, then we won't have this problem with being subjected to the kings putting in and controlling the bishops everywhere. If you watch that movie, uh, Beckett, with uh, Peter O'Toole and uh, uh, what's his face? Uh, I forget the guy was married to to uh, Elizabeth Taylor. I just went blank. But Beckett's a good movie uh, because it's taking place during this time period, the investor controversy, where the King of England appoints his just his drinking body as the bishop of <laughs> Archbishop of Constantinople. Right. Anyway, so he ends up becoming a real convert, and then he has to get he's ends up you know killed by the king because he actually follows Christian principles. So that's that's this time period that we're talking about of um, papal accessorism. And so um, the transition from investor to papal assessorism. So I agree with you there, Josh. I think that is a perceptive point that one of the reasons that Moses is delegating authority is because it's too much for one person to do. Um, and even if your motivations were good in the case of the Gregorian reforms to try to fix the Western church from being controlled by the state, I mean, it, it, it ended up being worse in the long run because then you get, you know, the whole history of, papalism in the second millennium. So I think that is, I think that is a good insightful point there. Josh, I'd like to, to jump in here just, just with one further comment. And then, yeah. uh, because th this, this is what I've, I've said to some people that have asked me a similar question to what you asked. I think in the East, and this is just my opinion, but I think in the East, there is a great deal of emphasis on the, uh, on the scripture that says that the church is the pillar and bulwark of truth. It doesn't say, I often tell my parishioners, don't read what's there in the scriptures, read what's not there. Th that, that particular verse does not say Peter is the pillar and bulwark. It doesn't say Peter, James, mm -hmm. and John are the pillar and bulwark. All 12 apostles mm -hmm. are the pillar. It does say the apostles are the foundation on which a lot of things are built, you know, but the, uh, Christ is the cornerstone and all that. But but it's the church. It's this, it's this organic entity, this institution of the body of Christ that, that is the pillar and bulwark. I think in the West, the emphasis is not so much on that, but a little bit more on Peter's confession, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God, and th that their emphasis is more on that, ignoring, of course, that when Jesus breathed on all of the apostles later after his resurrection and said, receive the Holy Spirit, whatever sins you bind and all that kind of stuff, I, I think they they fix it on, on that confession on the road to Caesarea Philippi because Jesus then said, uh, you know, depending on how you interpret um, and translate what, what was said in the Greek, uh, <laughs> you are Peter, and on this Peter, I'm going to build my church, 
or you are Peter and on this rock, I'm going to build my church. And, and that's kind of where they, they, they take off from there. So I think there's a difference in, in scriptural emphasis and, and there's huge implications from that. Well, it's interesting. One thing I would point out is okay. if we're talking about Moses as a, as a type of Christ, you should ask why were there 70 elders? Why the number 70? Well, uh, the apostles are, are, are basically the, the 12 patriarchs of the New Testament, mm -hmm. but there were also 70 apostles. And uh, so these 70 apostles and these 70 elders obviously have a connection. And the connection is we read in Genesis that there were 70 nations, at, you know, at, at, at that time, at least, that were described as the, all the nations of the world. And so this represents a, a reaching out to the entire globe, a, a universal authority. And, uh, and it, the idea that the church was to encompass all humanity. And uh, and so it, th there was no, you know, Christ, it, it would be the, the analogous person to Moses. But as it says in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And, and uh, what we in our English Bibles don't often see as a connection there is the name of Jesus is the same name as Joshua. But in, in the English language, unfortunately, we have. Uh, two different forms of the same name, but Joshua is the is the is the prototype of the New Testament Christ. Moses gets them to the to the Promised Land border, but they don't make it. <laughs> they, they don't cross over into the Promised Land. It's Christ that brings them into the Promised Land, and uh, so so all of this is significant. And uh, so, I, if, if there was, if if there, if papism was going to fit into this category in some kind of way, you'd have to have one of the seventy that would be really the guy who's controlling the other sixty-nine. But there's no indication of that uh, in the scriptures. That's interesting. Okay, I I can say that I uh, thank you by the way for each of your answers. That was very cogent. I like that. Um, having formed the question on the fly, I didn't know half the things you were talking about just now, Jay. Um, but as for like seeing the way that it kind of developed, I feel like my intuition was pointed in the right direction, that it's kind of a both and problem. That one person is not made to sustain the weight of God's authority in the earth, but also it's a Christological problem of interpretation throughout the scriptures as a whole. Am I following? Well, just think about how impossible it would be within the first, you know, in the ancient world for one bishopric to solve all these problems right i mean it's just not i mean well yeah i mean just what are you going to do mere, like you know it's like the mere lack of presence in every place at all right times. or you like, you know, like, like they're like, doing like, now. so are you going to write is everybody going to write letters to rome and then what the pope's going to have to sift through a, a thousand scrolls and mail it back and i mean it's going to take what 20 30 50 years to get <laughs> You know, it's just it's just it doesn't make sense in the ancient world to think that you would have one C that would be kind of operating in this, uh, you know, monarchical unit, uh, uh, you know, one uh, unilateral way. And, and again, I think you can interpret this any way you want. But when Peter was commenting on Paul's epistles, he didn't say, oh, don't listen to this pipsqueak because he wasn't with us when we were walking around with Jesus. He said, read his epistles. He's preaching the truth. He's teaching the truth. Yeah, he didn't say it, but I mean, they met and, you know, uh, Peter approved all that. But uh, if, if Peter really wanted to have everything come back down to him, he would have denigrated Paul's place in, in the burgeoning church. But he didn't do that. He affirmed Paul's place in the burgeoning church. So it, it didn't all come down to him as he saw it, because he would have said otherwise, perhaps, if he thought that was the case. Okay. So then, so, okay, so, so in addition to, um, let's say a Christological typology problem and one person not being able to sustain it, um, is, is it, is it just the case that because, and, and again, I, I, I agree with you, just, just throwing that out there. I agree with you that Christ as the head of the church and that being, let's say a centralized emphasis in what we understand the body as a symbol to mean in the New Testament, if Christ is the head, then it doesn't make sense to add another individual 
to be the face or something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. There's a good critique that uh, Sherard has in his book, Church Papacy Schism, where he points out that when this sort of evolves, when you get this kind of new ecclesiology that evolves in the early Middle Ages in the West, you actually start to see it manifest in the idea there being two bodies. There's the mystical body, of the, which, which is the church in general in the West, and there's also the magisterial body. And so you start to get these sort of like partitions of participation in Christ. So the laity, you know, they're, they're like maybe 30% in Christ, right? <laughs> but what's going on in Rome, that's 100% Christ, right? So there's these gradations that you start to see in the body. And I think that develops into this, this by the time of like Unum Sanctum, if you read Boniface VIII's Unum Sanctum, you know, the famous uh, letter where he says basically not just that you have to be in communion with the Roman see to be saved, but that all temporal uh, authority has to be under the Roman see. And basically if the Pope calls you to fight for him, you have to fight for him, right? So Because he, he has also has all temporal authority as well in, in, the, in the universe. He's the God Emperor. He's the Kwisatz Sadarak if you've read Dune, right? So there's this, there, in that Unum Sanctum, there's, there's almost this statement, I forget the exact way it's worded, but it's almost like the, the Pope is like united to Jesus and Mary in a way that even the rest of the church are not. So you start to notice mm. these gradations of union with Christ wherein the, the Pope himself is sort of like super united to Christ. And then you get like the Cardinals and the Magisterium, which are highly united to Christ. And then you get the bishops throughout the world, which are pretty united to Christ. And then you get the laity, which are yeah, kind of, you see, you see how that starts to develop. And that's, that's a problem because, you know, go back to Ignatius, right? What does he say that where the Bishop is, there is the church. So the fullness Catholicity, which eventually in the West becomes no, the idea becomes that it's centered in one guy and in one church and in Rome. Catholicity can't be just in Rome. Catholicity is fully present in every local church. It's a totally different ecclesiology. Mm. So you're saying that the Pope actually violates the idea of universal church, like fundamentally. Yeah, and that's why that authority says that we shouldn't call ourselves universal bishops to the exclusion of the other bishops. So then, so, so then in, in, in the Eastern church, and forgive my ignorance, in the Eastern church, uh, there isn't this gradient of connection to Christ in that same sense, or is there? Because it does seem that there's a, let's say, a pecking order or hierarchy of, of you know, let's say the saints who are in his presence now versus the saints who are in our presence here versus a priest inside of a parish or let's say a, a, a bishop or, or, or however the, the hierarchy seems to manage itself. You're saying that the hierarchy doesn't actually indicate a proximity to Christ necessarily. It indicates something else. Well, I'll let the priests answer that. They could answer that better than me. Okay, fair enough. Well, the saints that are in heaven are in a different category altogether because they've crossed the finish line and they're part of that great cloud of witnesses. And, um, and the Pope is claiming to cross that line before he gets there. Is that the problem? Well, I, 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 I suppose you could, you could, you could say that. Um, okay. When you look at how a bishop functions in in his diocese in the Orthodox Church, he really has, you know, a a, a lot of latitude. Uh, to decide things. And, and uh, it's really beautiful to see a bishop uh, who's managing his diocese and got, giving guidance to his, his priest and, uh, and exercising that authority. And when he comes to a parish, you, you, you see in, in real life what St. Ignatius was talking about, where the bishop is, there is the Catholic Church. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the Roman Catholic Church, Every bishop is essentially a vicar bishop. They're just, they really don't have that authority to really rule their diocese. They have some leeway, some, some uh, sphere of some control, but the Pope at any moment could sweep in and, and override anything the bishop wants to do. Whereas in the Orthodox Church, we certainly have, you know, primates of local churches. But even the Patriarch of Moscow can't just go into another bishop's diocese and just unilaterally start overruling things that that bishop is doing. Mm. The Synod as a whole could do that, but not 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 any one bishop on his own authority. So it's crucial to keep it a council 
rather than a person. Right, because basically this is the entire church correcting, uh, you know, one bishop if that's if, if it's necessary. But it's not one bishop who has some super authority correcting another bishop. There's one there's one uh, question in the in the, the the live chats here, Tyler, that I think is relevant to what I'm talking about. And then we can go yeah, back go to your list of questions. That's fine. Uh, it says it's from uh, pseudo Rasputin says uh, faith unaltered. Would you say the Gregorian reforms was an attempt to make the papacy great again? Um, I know that 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 Jay, you had mentioned this time frame specifically. Do you think that this was something that was done as like a political stunt? It sounds like what they're asking. I'm sure there was mixed motivations. I'm sure that there were people in the West who genuinely uh, wanted to have the church independent from the state. I mean, the investiture controversy was was a big problem, and it it's just as much a problem in the East with the emperors that we talked about that were you know trying to control the church as it is in the West with Carolinians, right? They tried to control and cajole the papacy to reject the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which to his credit, at that time, the Pope didn't submit to uh, the Carolinian theologians. He did affirm the Seventh Council. So, and then you get a lot of pressure put uh, by the Franks after that on the papacy. St. Photius complains about this in his letters that it was actually the Franks that were sending missionaries into Bulgaria, evangelizing with the Filioque. So they were overstepping these boundaries. It wasn't actually the Pope at that time. The Pope at that time still said that you can't change the creed, and they had the creed. Leo Leo had the creed made. The third had the creed made up, you know, without the filioque. So, but yeah. after that, you sort of get more and more pressure put on uh, the Pope. So I think that there was probably geopolitical power motivations, and there was probably mixed desires of also wanting to not have the church submit to the state. So. It's, it's probably not an either or. I think there's a lot of motivations going on because I think the Orthodox view, uh, you know, we probably wouldn't think that the West is fully in schism officially until at least Lyons, right? So that's where they first dogmatically state the theology that we can't agree with. So there's already beginnings of ruptures prior to that. But um, anyway. That's my take. You know, and, and by the way, for, to what to what Jay said, you know, we, we Orthodox point a lot to the Carolingians and the German princes influence in the papacy. How in the world was that any different from what the Byzantine emperor did? Exactly. I don't think it was really that different at all. And the and the influence and the cajoling and all of that stuff that was put on by the emperor of, of the Roman Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, put on not only Constantinople, but the others when they were under his control, when they were not, and oh, oh well. And that would just put more pressure on, on the patriarch of Constantinople. So we, we, we look west and we kind of make a lot of fun of that, but I don't think there's any difference in what was taking place in the east, quite frankly. Fair enough. Okay. Right on. On, right with, on. on, with, your, uh, on with your list there, Tyler. I'm done with the no, <laughs> I mean, is that... It, does that is that su uh, suffice for you, Josh? Or? I, I think that I think that was a very well-rounded series of answers to what I was trying to form into a. Question. Could I ask a question? Because one thing that kind of got missed that you know, if I was listening to this as a say a Protestant, <clears throat> um, and I'd like either Father Jonathan or Father Whiteford to uh, uh, to address this is what would you say to somebody who said, and I'm asking you because you know you, you're in the priesthood. What if somebody said, well, okay, so maybe the the Roman Catholic attitude has this gradations of Pope and, you know, Cardinals and magisterium. And then maybe the, the laity are kind of seen as not really possessing, you know, the fullness of participation in Christ or something, but wouldn't you have the same problem? Because don't you kind of treat your bishops as if they have this like super ontological status and then, you know, laity or subservient. In other words, could you just transfer, if I was a Protestant I, and I'm listening to this, I might say, well, well, couldn't I just transfer this to the the, the bishop and, and the local church? Don't you denigrate uh, people with this worship of authority of bishops? Well, what I would say is, is you find in the scriptures themselves that the apostles were given certain authority that the average layman didn't have. I mean, Christ said to the apostles, uh, you know, whosoever sends you, you uh, remit, they're remitted, and whosoever sins you uh, do not remit, they're not remitted. Or in other words, they're not forgiven. And he gave them the power to the bind and to lose. And he said, you know, whoever hears you hears me, and whoever rejects you rejects me. So 
yeah, the, the, you know, the, the, the apostles and their successors have unique authority within the church. Uh, but it's, uh, but, but that's, that's biblical. You find that in, in, in the gospels. And, um, so in, in a, in a bishop's diocese, he's functioning as this representative of Christ, you know, when, 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 uh, St. Ignatius was talking about the, the bishop surrounded by his priests and deacons and the faithful celebrating the Eucharist, that this is an image of Christ and his church together. And so the, the, the apostles are serving that function. Now they have to be faithful and, and obviously bishops can fall into error, but that's where you start getting into, you know, the, the kind of corrections that exist within the church, but a bishop who is doing what he's supposed to do and teaching the faith rightly uh has more authority than the average layman and he gets to tell people what to do and uh and there is this thing called obedience that we're we're supposed to give to uh like saint paul in hebrews says remember them that have the rule over you well there are people who do have the rule over you so that obviously puts them in a different situation than those who are the ones being ruled by those people and and i think also one has to remember that unlike our our protestant brethren when a bishop has hands laid on him, and, and for a presbyter for that, that matter, they are given, to one degree or another, uh, a very supernatural authority and power that just isn't there in any of the Protestant denominations. None of them. None. And so that, that, that power and authority has to be, of course, exercised in a certain way and so forth. But uh, that's there. And I think Our Lady know that intrinsically or not. Uh, that's the reason they kiss our hand. That's the reason they, they do certain things because they, they honor us knowing what we can do and why we're placed there. And I think a lot of that becomes a, a challenge for a, a priest or a bishop to, 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 to keep them humble. Um, but we have to remember that, that, that priests and bishops in our church are given through the laying on of hands, a supernatural authority to do what we do. And and the Protestants don't have that. That we, you know, maybe the Roman Catholics do that. That's that's debatable. But we do. We know we do. And like I said, I think our 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 Lady know that. So it sounds like the difference is that authority is not attached to levels of savedness or proximity to Christ. Yeah. But rather, that authority is something that is actually um, conduit style a delivery or a, or a reflection back to Christ in some sense. I, I would say, and if someone disagrees, feel free to correct me, but to I, I, that's where I thought you were going with that question. I would say that from the vantage point of salvation, everybody's in the same boat. You know, it's not like, well, if you're a bishop, you're more saved than a laity, right? We're all on the same, running the same marathon, you know, to use Paul's analogy. So, yeah, right. If, if you think about it like this, in this life, in the church there's a hierarchy but when we talk about the saints all that changes because for example saint nina of georgia here you had a slave girl who there's no one lower on the totem pole in that time period than a slave girl and yet because she knew christ she was able to convert the country of georgia to the christian faith and uh went and, you know, the, the highest ranking bishop in the Orthodox Church will bow and kiss the relics of St. Nina and be be thankful to God that he had been given the opportunity to do so. So there's there's a hierarchy in this life. But what the hierarchy is going to be in the next life is a whole nother story. That's a good perspective <laughs> to put it into. Yeah, I'm exactly. glad you worded Perfect. it like that. Yeah, that was awesome. All right, guys. So I think this is a good segue into uh and by the way josh you're getting called out you need to stop being so reasonable and spice things up and call somebody a heretic or something so that's what mitch is saying in the chat <laughs> i'm so sorry I should, <laughs> there should be more fireworks and sparks come on man do better <laughs> <laughs> but all right so let's get into some objections from protestants there there's three main things and one of the things i i haven't listed this just kind of came to me because we dane and i on our new segment uh, entitled Three Crowns, uh, our Trinitarian Apologetics uh, segment, we've been encountering Unitarians that it seems like the number one go-to uh, objection that I've heard from multiple different people on that in that camp is that what we're teaching is traditions of men, right? And the, th and the thing, and I, I'd love to hear how all of you address that, but to me, and, and 
feel free to correct me if I if I've got this screwed up in any way. But it seems like from what you guys have been saying, this is the church, right? The unity and the body that is Christ, right? Made up of individuals uh, that are, you know, in, in the Orthodox Church. Is that this is Christ's teaching that he has delegated authority to men uh, to pass on, like what we said earlier. And so this isn't traditions of men. The part that they're missing is that this is traditions that, of men inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so I don't know if you guys would word that a little bit differently, but uh, and we'll start with Father Jonathan Ivanoff on this one and just go around. Uh, but how would you deal with the objection that, uh, for example, the Trinity is just a tradition of men? No one in the Old or New Testament taught a three-person God. Uh, how, how would you deal with that obje objection? Well, I, I would I would recommend anybody listening to my answer right now go out and buy the book called uh, The Religion of the Apostles by Father Stephen DeYoung. I think I think it's outstanding. And he talks about how rather than refer to the 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 Old Testament as a monotheistic religion, that he makes the case. And I think he's right uh, after reading and looking up the references and et cetera, et cetera, that a, a case could be made that in the Old Testament, very clearly there is this one God. And then there is this other God that that has appeared on Earth and so forth. And, and, and many of these. There you go. Well, I don't know if that's the book, but but the the, uh, the the point is, there is clearly in the Old Testament an appearance of of one person and then a, of another person, both of whom, of whom were called God. So this idea that the Trinity doesn't appear in the Scriptures on the surface of that that's true. It's just like in the uh, in Islam, the their their core teaching about who God is. And I forget the word; it's in Arabic. I'm sorry. Uh, it's not found in the Quran either. It's found in the Hadiths, but the Hadiths came many hundreds of years later. So the same thing is true in the Trinity. The components of the Trinity are there. And if you're willing to see them and see how they're put together and, and accept the Father's interpretation of, of all of that, that, that became our teaching on the Holy Trinity, you'll see it. It's there. If you don't want to see it, it's not there. It, it's really, I think, that simple for, for a lot of people. And when, yeah. what they're willing to accept. Yeah, the book I was holding up uh, wasn't Father Stephen DeYoung's, but uh, Alan Segal's Two Powers in Heaven. And this is the book that convinced me that there was this concept of Jewish Benetarianism and could even be argued Trinitarianism within Second Temple Judaism. We know yeah, that Judaism right. is not a monolithic group, right? But within the structure, within this framework, within some Second Temple Jewish camps, there is this concept of two powers in heaven, right? And so this is where that you know stems from. Uh, but Father John, uh, how how would you answer the question? Uh, it, you know, you you guys are just teaching traditions of men. Uh, how 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 would that work for you? I think you have to understand the nature of the church, which is clearly taught in the scriptures. And uh, you know, the church is the body of Christ, and so therefore. You know, if if the church is the body of Christ and Christ is the head of the church, it follows that the church as a whole cannot possibly err, because then you'd have to be attributing error to to Christ Himself. Right. And um, so, in addition to what Father Jonathan just said, I would just say, uh, when you come to the point where you realize what the church is, you realize that you can trust the church and what it teaches, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and I, when you look at the first chapter of the Gospel of John, it's very clear that Christ is not just some created being. And, and uh, he, he, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. Uh, that, that's about as clear as it's going to get, that, uh, that Christ is God. And, uh, but the doctrine of the Trinity is just sort of an, a, a way of trying to explain it to people because there were disputes that arose. The church doesn't go out of its way to define things more than it's, than is necessary. But when you have people who erroneously teach things like Arius and say that Christ was a created being, then the church has to explain why Arius is wrong. But when you, like there's many things you cannot prove, but you but you nevertheless believe, you know, like you, 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 if you love your wife, you, you, you believe she loves you and uh, you can't prove that. And uh, you also if you if you love your wife and you trust her, you believe that if she tells you something that you can trust it. Well, obviously, any human being is fallible, but when we're talking about the church. 
is is all that on a whole different level <laughs> and, and so when you when you realize what the church is at a certain point you just have to say i know that when the church teaches something that it's true gotcha jay same question yeah this is a <clears throat> topic that I got into pretty recently because of interacting with a lot of Muslims in the last four or five years, four or five years. So um, I did get to get deeper and deeper into this, this question of the Old Testament triad, which I kind of already knew, you know, before interacting with the Muslims and the Unitarians that the Trinity was there in the Old Testament, but it was actually surprising to me going deeper into that, how much uh, of this distinction was already there. And I think that a lot of it has to do with just kind of not being really familiar with the Old Testament um, across the board, whether it's Christians or whether it's Muslims or whoever. A lot of us just aren't familiar with that. Sure. And then, uh, you know, if you look at, for example, I did a talk uh, four or five years ago that, that did pretty well. It's got a, it's got quite a bit of views because I started with Genesis and I just sort of walking the way, all, working my way all the way up through the Old Testament with all of these passages that reference Yahweh, the angel of the Lord, and then his spirit. And you see it, you see it all throughout the Old Testament. In fact, <clears throat> um, preparing for the Daniel Hakikachu debate, we got into about four or five different recent Jewish rabbinical scholars who are now admitting that there isn't this Unitarian generic monotheism in the Old Testament. In fact, there's quite a bit of attestation to the possibility, as you pointed out, that it actually looks like there might even be one uh, summer, I think, the the scholar Summers uses the term hypostasis. <laughs> so mm -hmm. he, says, he says there might even be three hypostases. Boyarin says that uh, the early Christians actually represent a conservative form of not rabbinical Judaism, but Judaism faithful to the text. Right. So again, you, you start to see, wait a minute, Siegel, Boyarin, mm -hmm. Summer, you got these modern you know, Jewish scholars who don't believe in the gospel are actually admitting, okay, yeah, there's, there's actually multiple. And that's, I think what father DeYoung is kind of getting at in that book <clears throat> is the mm -hmm. same point that a lot of these Jewish scholars are admitting was that the actual texts mm -hmm. themselves kind of support what Jesus argues, right? Cause if you read the gospel of John, uh, pretty much in every chapter of John, there's either a reference to the deity of Christ or to the triad, right? Right. right. So that's every chapter of John has that. And it's particularly, you know, it's about John five to about nine where Jesus is, is interacting with the Pharisees. And he just keeps saying that, I'm not saying anything new. You yourselves already believe that no man sees the Father at any time. So who do you think Moses was talking to? Right. And then he says, me. <laughs> He's implying that he was talking to me, Jesus, right? Right. And so that enrages the Pharisees. And so that tells us that, well, Jesus is saying that, you know, he is divine. He's who's the I am of the burning bush and so forth. Mm -hmm. So point being is that <clears throat> I think when you read, the the text holistically old and new testament as a revelation of christ yep. i think it becomes more and more apparent that the trinity is just everywhere it's 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 but a lot of people as father i've not pointed out they they go to texts and they'll pick one right yep. they'll pick well the father's greater than i yep and so every there's an they have an assumption about that verse all the other verses then have to be squeezed <laughs> yeah. into that verse yep so, mm -hmm. so that's yeah. a faulty hermeneutic because all the texts or have to be harmonized. There's not one text that's like the one that all the other ones have to be squeezed into. And every Arian or Unitarian has that move where they take one text, which has a presupposition about, well, greater has to be ontological status. And so therefore the son is a creature. But what about all the other texts that identify the son as not a creature? Oh, well, those have to be right. explained away, you see. So that's a, it's a hermeneutical mistake, and it's also just a lack of understanding the totality of the text. Right. I, I love the text that whenever John, I think I'm, I think it's John 12, 39 through 41, uh, he explains who exactly Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6. Exactly. And this is Jesus. This is him. <laughs> and so, no, you're right. I think if you don't take, or if you're isolating passages like you talked about, you can come to those dis you can come to those conclusions that Unitarian and you know others would come to, but the problem is whenever you actually start harmonizing those texts, is you have to do exactly what you just said, and that you take one text and try to squeeze in all the rest of the text to that text instead of harmonizing them and coming up with the Trinity like the church has taught for two thousand exactly. plus years now. So right on, right on. Uh Father uh Whiteford, was there anything that you wanted to add in that little segment? before we move on or no i think that that covers it pretty well okay all right uh josh is there anything that you wanted to bring 
before no, we go on to the next. No, one. I'm, okay. I'm just enjoying the. Enjoy, yeah, that's enjoying good. The one thing I would add me. is that if a Protestant says, yeah. "Well, but the Trinity isn't in the Bible, like the Word isn't there," <clears throat> there's a lot of things that Protestants believe that aren't there. Right? Mm -hmm. the, the the New Testament, Old Testament canon is not there. It's mm -hmm. not listed. Mm -hmm. So, so already from the default, right? If the expectation is that we're only going to believe the explicit terminology, then we that would exclude Protestantism. Right. Right. How to conduct a uh, New Testament liturgy in the church is not in the New Testament itself. So there's a lot of things that we do, you know, the exact same thing. Right on, right on. So let's go to another objection then that I hear talking to, you know, uh, especially different Protestants. Um, the thing is, is whenever we discuss normative authority and apostolic succession with them, they agree. And, and this is something that we alluded to a little bit earlier, uh, but they agree that the Holy Spirit is passed on through the laying on of hands, and that even the apostles had authority that Christ delegated to them. But that authority the apostles had does not get passed down to their successors. How would each of you respond to this objection and demonstrate that authority is handed down from the apostles to their successors, and so on and so forth? And then we can start with Father John Whiteford uh, on this one if we want to. Well, that view, that view makes nonsense of a whole lot of the, the New Testament, because if you're saying, for example, that when Christ gave the apostles the power to forgive sins or to not forgive sins mm -hmm. or to bind and to lose, if you're going to say, well, that was just for the original apostles, then what meaning does it really have to us now? Because we don't have anybody like that. So uh, it, you could have just left that out of the New Testament and we would be no better or worse off. Uh, so it, 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 it doesn't make sense. Now, one of the big arguments a lot of Protestants like to make is they make a lot of hay out of the fact that the word presbyter or elder and then the word bishop or episkopos is sometimes used interchangeably in the New Testament. Right. But what I always point out to him is even in the New Testament, if you if you say, well, at that, that time, that terminology was basically talking about the same office, you still have three levels of uh, ecclesiastical authority. You have the apostles as the highest, and then you have elders slash uh, episcopos uh, or bishops as the as the sort of delegates of the apostles, and then you have the deacons. But by the time of St. Ignatius of Antioch, which is not very far after the New Testament period at all, and he, he was a disciple of the Apostle John who was martyred in 112. So we're not talking about after Constantine, late accretions or anything like that. He makes it abundantly clear that the top level terminology now is bishop. The word episcopos or bishop is used exclusively for those who are the successors of the apostles. And we talk about the the bishops as having an apostolic office. Now, we don't normally talk about our bishops as apostle so-and-so, mm -hmm. but that's out of respect for the original apostles. But we, we know and we understand that they're successors of the apostles. They're filling an apostolic role. And uh, so it's just a matter of how the terminology developed over time. It's not really a, a difference, but there's always been three levels of authority. And when... When St. John the Apostle, for example, talked about how Diotrephes wouldn't recognize his authority, he didn't say, well, he's a believer, he, he believes in Jesus, so the fact that he doesn't accept my authority doesn't mean anything. Uh, they're, they're, he's part of the church just as much as everybody else, uh, and we all just need to get along with each other. He, he clearly is, making, is, is, is asserting that he has the right to be acknowledged as an authority and that Diotrephes is wrong for not doing that. And so he's functioning the same way a bishop functions today. If you have a priest that's not listening to his bishop, then the bishop has every right to uh, discipline that, that priest. So the New Testament functions, as, the New Testament church authority functions the same way as the church functions today. And the Protestants basically have to say that there was authority and the church functioned with a, with an authority that ceased to exist after the New Testament, and the church now is in a is functioning in a way that didn't exist during the time of the New Testament at all. And right. so, to say that they're governed by Scripture alone, well, now they're in uncharted territory because the Scriptures don't tell us what that what what church looks like when you only have two levels of authority. Right, 
right? There's a major change very early on that affects the rest of the tradition and how it's handed down uh, specifically. So right on. Father uh, Father Jonathan Ivanov, what do well, you... Well, I, I think that to build on, on what Father John just said, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and Tyler, I know you're going to get mad at me for saying this, but shameless plug, uh, on my channel, we, we interviewed Perry Robinson uh, just a few days ago, and we're going to air uh, that interview coming up. And, and Perry is a lay apologist, and he's a very intelligent man uh, and, and knows his stuff. He used to be one of the researchers on the Bible Answer Man many years ago. Yeah. Uh, so so the, the, the fellow knows his stuff. One of the things, this, this very question came up, and, and we, uh, we spoke about it. And one of the things that he talked about is the, the Protestant objection to say that, well, presbyters and, and episcopy, you know, was sort of the same thing. Clearly, it's not the same thing, because what you even see in the scriptures is the one thing the bishops could do that the presbyters could not do was ordain. Paul talked about laying his hands on Timothy. Now, it also talks about, you know, he says to Timothy, when you had hands laid on you by the presbyters, but clearly Paul also says, I did this. And so if he was doing it and the presbyters were also doing it, it's not that different from what we see today in ordinations where You've got the bishops laying hand on maybe a a, a, a presbyteral candidate, and then, uh, or or laying hands on a uh, an episcopal candidate, and other yeah. bishops touching the other bishop so that somehow that 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 gets done too. So, um, but clearly, what what a, a, an episcopos a bishop could do in the New Testament uh, that that act of ordination is clearly what the bishops are only doing 30, 50, 80, 100 years later and more. So to say that the presbyters were doing the same thing as the bishops is ignoring what the scriptures are actually saying. And by the early fourth century, there was a controversy someplace, Perry talked about this, where presbyters were found ordaining other presbyters. And boy, the church just came down on that really hard and said, this should not be taking place. This is not as, this, as it has always been. And so to say that then and to say it's not always been that way and to find in the scriptures where you've got the apostles laying hands. On, on bishops and bishops laying hands on other people and that simply continuing that proves right there that you don't have um uh bishops uh functioning the same way as presbyters or vice versa it just wasn't done that way back then <clears throat> right on thank you for that and no father jonathan plug your channel anytime i love it so jay is there thank anything you, that you would add absolutely I remember absolutely. when i was reformed one of the problem texts i encountered reading the bible that i, I didn't know what to do with i remember taking it to the Presbyterian elders was <clears throat> uh, in Acts one twenty when Judas dies. It says, "Let another take his episcopate," mm -hmm. and I remember realizing that it says "take his episcopate," and and I brought that to some of the Reformed elders, and the response was, "Well, this is just a unique case to fulfill the prophecy," and I'm like, "But but we believe that nobody." succeeds to the episcopate <laughs> so like so it seems a little spacious to argue that well it's just to fulfill a prophecy i mean okay maybe in that one verse but you know we clearly have paul telling timothy that when i lay hands on you you pass the holy spirit to men after you who you know are qualified for it don't hastily lay hands on anyone which right you know if we're just doing a symbolic service like if i hastily laid hands on it i could hastily take it back <laughs> <laughs> right so, it just doesn't seem to have the same significance as, um, you know, something that transmits the spirit. So there's a lot more, I think, going on there, but specifically the distinction between apostles and their successors. One thing that comes to mind is that, you know, Jude, as Father Whiteford said, that Jude says the faith once for all delivered for the saints. So I think that there is a complete body of teaching that is the apostolic deposit. Yeah. And, you know, if you read Paul in Acts 20, it says Paul taught day, day and night for three years in Ephesus. Right. And then he tells Timothy, all the things that you heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, you commit those things to men afterwards who are faithful. So he, does, he doesn't say only the things that I wrote to you. Mm -hmm. He says all of the catechetical, you know, uh, apologetical, you know, exegetical lectures that Paul taught day and night in Ephesus. He says, pass those things on. And so there's an, a, there's an equating of the word of God also with the oral <laughs> teaching, not mm -hmm. just the written text. And so that apostolic exegesis and catechesis, I think, also qualifies as word of God and deposit of the faith. And I think that when the apostles died, the successors then have the job to transmit that deposit, right? They don't have a, any injunction to create or to have new divine public revelations. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, that's my understanding. I mean, I, I know that we have the belief that there are saints with clairvoyance, but that's still not like a new apostolic revelation. Right. That revelation, when John died, there's not new public revelations in the sense of new, new, you know, we're not going to get a, you know, a Muhammad or a Joseph Smith type of situation, right? Where right. you get a new, oh, I'm the new prophet and I've got to, you know, recorrect these previous errors. Mm -hmm. So that's a distinction as well is that the successors are transmitting and explaining, expositing a complete deposit. It's not an ongoing revelation. Right. If we take serious what John said, and I think it was John chapter 20 of the gospel or John chapter 21, everything that Jesus said and taught, it, the, the world's books could not contain it. And then to go back and say, but everything that the apostles taught is right here in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. I think it seems to contradict itself. <laughs> um, and not only that, but then you have people that I've talked to personally that used to be a host on this show, um, would say that some of the tradition has actually been lost to time. And I, and you know, we can't say, well, what tradition is that? Well, we don't know, obviously it's been lost. And so just out of curiosity, and we can go through this, uh, kind of quickly if we want, uh, and then Josh, I know you had something, but how would you guys respond to someone that made, makes that affirmation that we actually lost tradition early on? Uh, in in the beginnings of Christianity, and anybody can jump on that. Whoever whoever has an idea, <laughs> basically, you'd have to believe that the church ceased to be whole to to believe yeah. that. Yeah. Um, I mean, there there's probably some information you could say that's been lost, uh, you know, over time that that we might be curious to know, but but these are not matters of the faith. Like it'd be interesting if we had a detailed biography of all 12 apostles that that we could say this is absolutely what you know the date they were born you know where they went on this day but everything that has to do with what we believe has been preserved and if you deny that then you're really denying the uh, you know that the, that the faith is is an ongoing reality of the church is an ongoing reality well, I, I, I got to jump in because the, this yep. leads into a, a, a topic that I've, I've become very involved in in the last year or two. Mm -hmm. I, I find it uh, such a specious argument for people to say, well, the church has lost traditions. What are they? Well, we don't know, but it's lost them. <laughs> really? OK, so you're going to argue that. All right. So let's turn it around a little bit. Paul. And by extension, we have to believe Luke because Luke went almost everywhere. Paul went. Paul was in Ephesus for three years. Who also was in Ephesus? John the Apostle, John, John the Theologian, John the Evangelist. Who was in his care for as long as she was alive in his life? Jesus' mother. Mm -hmm. Now, if Luke was with Paul and Paul was in Ephesus, and Ephesus was where the Virgin Mary lived, and there's a house there that's purported to be her house, okay? Is it possible that Luke met her? And by the way, he is the only one who has infant narratives in his in his gospel. Well, not the only one, but you know what I mean. So where did he get that information from? Was that one of the teachings that was lost? No, it was not. But then where did he get it from? It wasn't like the Holy Spirit said, well, this was the story. Let me tell you to it. No, he heard it from someone. So he had to hear, hear it from her or he heard it from someone who heard it from her or something like that. So that's the exact opposite of what people are trying to argue when they say, well, the, the church has lost traditions. No, the church hasn't lost traditions. The church has preserved those traditions. The gospels preserve some of it and the uh, the things that the uh, uh, apostolic fathers and so forth later on uh, write preserves the rest of it. It's all there. It's never been lost. Christ said, I will never fail you or forsake you, that I will be with you always and so forth and so on. He made promises and the Lord doesn't keep his promises. What kind of Lord is that? So you, you, there's a certain amount of, there's a logical point. I think you can take some of these arguments too, but I think at some point you've got to just cut bait and say, look, I'm going to believe what the church has always believed and, and, and it can be proved going back to the very beginning. Right. Jay. Well, even if we did concede that there was lost traditions, I don't see how that would help a Protestant argument at all. How, how does that help a Protestant argument? Good question. Good question. Um, I honestly don't know. Um, I, like I said, I've just, I mean, I'm just thinking of like, okay, so right, right. You know, the, the Bible talks about, you know, the books of the wars of the Lord or something like this, which we don't have access to. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, or, uh, the book of, you know, Nathan, the prophet or something like this, right. We don't have those texts, but, uh, and I agree with father, father John Wyford that 
there, you know, if, if divine providence didn't include that in the deposit, then it's, it's not going to be that relevant to, to the faith. And so, you know, maybe there's some information that's lost, but even if we conceded lost information, I, I still don't see how that would have anything to do with bolstering the Protestant view at all. Like what, to me, that would actually be in our favor because it's like, okay, so now you're admitting that there's tradition that's not written that is from God. It's, it's still an admission. That's like, I mean, I just don't see how it helps Protestantism. So well, Dale, it, there's also another yeah. aspect to that. If we believe that God has preserved tradition within the church, all of the tradition that, that the apostles taught and so forth. And, you know, where was the lost letter of the Corinthians? Where was the lost letter to the Laodiceans? You know, St. Paul refers to them. There was another letter that he said he wrote before first Corinthians. There's a letter to the Laodiceans, which he wanted another community to read. They, right. they haven't been preserved. So then one has the question, did God allow those to be lost? And if he did, why? But mm -hmm. th that may be just the false argument to make. They were lost. Maybe they repeated a lot of what was in some other letter, some other epistle. Maybe they didn't need to be preserved. Maybe they were. So you, you get those kind of arguments as well. So I'm glad you brought that up, Father Jonathan, because so uh, Dale's actually in the chat right now. And he there's two posts I want to bring up real quick and then and then we can move on after after this. But he brings up the the third or the first Corinthians that was actually written before, you know, first Corinthians. Uh, the pres uh, please show me the preserved tradition from Paul's lost letter to the Corinthians. Was that all preserved orally? Uh, what did he say in that letter? And then to answer your question, Jay, uh, it doesn't help. But Tyler told me that the traditions are infallibly and completely preserved. So I said that isn't true. And then you guys seem to agree. So, well, I mean, if Paul taught yep. with apostolic authority, then the information, then those and those letters are lost. Then again i just how does that that's an admission that there's that there's oral or written teaching outside of the written text that we have and so that's an that's that's already admitting that it's not sola scriptura you see what i'm saying like mm -hmm. it's an admission that there is even if he even, even if whether it's lost or not or preserved in some other way orally it's an admission that it's it's oral word of god outside of the written text which doesn't to me make sense with Sola Scriptura. That would put it in a completely different category at that point. There's the word of God that's contained in scripture and the word of God that has been lost in time. Am I, am I following? Yeah, but I'm saying that if you believe in, I mean, Sola Scriptura might, a Sola Scripturist might theoretically admit that there's the word of God outside of the written text, but it seems to me that, and if I recall the way that Dale was arguing when we had the discussion a while back was that, yeah. but whatever's oral doesn't matter because I'm only bound by what's written because that's the only thing that can be known. And my point to him was you still require oral tradition to know the actual canon of the Bible. So you can't like get mm -hmm. away from oral tradition by saying that there might be all these oral traditions outside the Bible, but I'm only bound by the written text because the written text themselves, the church is a pillar and ground of truth. Right. Gotcha. Josh, is there anything that you'd like to add? I know you unmuted a minute ago. Um, um, I, I was I was going to make kind of a like a, an intuitive statement that I think I was catching on to uh, and get kind of a yes or no, but I think at this point it might derail a little bit, so I'll kind of let it slide. Okay. All right. Uh, the last objection then that I have from the Protestant side is that this idea um, of an invisible church. And my question to you all just straight up, do you guys think that this idea of an invisible church does damage not only to the uh, to the theology of the incarnation, but to the historicity and actuality of the incarnation itself. And then uh, let's start with Jay on this one. Right, and Nestorius taught that Jesus was a dual subject, right? So the condemnation of Ephesus surrounds the dual subject Christology of Nestorius. Mm -hmm. And so he basically had a division between Jesus of Nazareth, the historical subject, and the logos, the divine, you know, second person of Godhead subject. And the response of Ephesus was that no, Christ is a divine subject, and there's not a subject that the per that the humanity that it possesses has. It's it's humanized in the logos that assumed that human nature. So likewise, you could have that same principle apply ecclesiologically to a dividing of the special mode of God's presence. That was present in the in the body, the physical body of Christ, right? As the second person of Godhead is, is uniquely present in 
Jesus of Nazareth who's walking around, right? We, we mm -hmm. agree that Jesus is omnipresent in terms of his divinity, right? But the second person of God is uniquely in the mode of being incarnate over in Jerusalem, such that he's not in, uh, you know, I don't know, Gaza. In the, oh, I guess that's in Jerusalem. He's not in... Uh, uh, He's not in uh, Megiddo in the same way that he's in. He's in the temple. Okay, so he's omnipresent, but the the presence in that body is unique. Mm -hmm. So likewise, the church is his body. Then his presence in the, that body is unique, such that he's not present in every place that claims to be that body. So that doesn't mean that there's no grace in those groups or grace that leads people to the church, but it just means that the mode of his presence in the body known as the what we think is Orthodox Church, is unique. And so it's a special presence that's not equated to the omnipresence, right? So, right. Um, yeah, I think that that's exactly what happens if we believe in an invisible church. And then if you look at Paul's epistles, this is something I had to grapple with when I was a Calvinist, was, mm -hmm. you know, Paul's epistles aren't written to the elect. I mean, he's, he'll say the elect in Corinth or the elect in Ephesus, but it's not the secret elect. It's an actual visible historical structural church. And so when I would read those texts as a Calvinist, I'd have to say, well, he is writing to a visible church, but really it's written to the unknown elect because the that's the only people who can read it and understand it, right? Everybody else is blinded. right? And so, but there's, Paul doesn't constantly make this flip-flop distinctions. In fact, he just equates the body of Christ and the predestined with the visible church at Ephesus. Mm -hmm. Right on. And, you know, I was reading, uh, I think, I think her name's Elaine Pagel. She wrote, uh, she's, oh, yeah, yeah, you, yeah, yeah. Um, if you're not doing research on Gnosticism, I suggest not reading her. But, but the point is, is that she would even attribute this idea of an invisible church or an invisible uh, body in that sense to Gnosticism. And that kind of yeah, blew me not. away. Right. Yeah. Right on. Uh, Father uh, Jonathan Ivanov, uh, we'll go to you next. This the idea of the invisible church. Uh, do you think that this does damage theologically and to the historicity and actuality of the uh, incarnation? Well, I, I, I we we spoke with Perry about this, and I, and I'm trying to remember. In fact, I think I generated the, the the discussion by making a claim, and and I invite Jay or Father John to correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I I do believe many Protestants believe in, and I think it's called a doctrine of cessationism, that that the church church ceased to exist. Mm -hmm. uh, sometime after the apostles died. Father John, am I uh, correctly? Uh, quote, yeah, there are some I, Protestants that believe that. I would say most of the mainstream, like the Reformed, don't teach that. I don't think the Lutherans teach that either, but there are some like uh, Baptists that, that would teach that basically the church ceased to exist for some period of time and then was re reestablished, re re particularly restorationists like the Church of Christ. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, some Pentecostals I know teach this also. <clears throat> and and so the, the, the problem with that is that I, if someone says, well, only an invisible church exists, I would challenge them to define what that invisible church is. Hmm. Because if they're saying it's not visible and it doesn't have the marks of a visible church, what are the marks of a visible church that you think should be there? That's the problem. They define one thing or they don't even define one thing and they completely disregard and blow away the other without saying what the marks of a visible church or an invisible church is. So it, it, it's sort of like a um, uh, they're making a declarative statement with no substance to the content of what they're claiming. Now, that's the way I see it. And, and the problem with that is that the church that the apostles left behind was a visible church. It had structure, it had organization, it had spiritual life, it had teaching. Uh, you, know, you, you look at Acts 2, verses 42 to 47, that Jerusalem church in those immediate days, weeks, and months following Pentecost had form and function and visibility, and it could clearly be identified it was here and it was not here and so forth and so on. So the, the, the claim is merely a claim. I'd like to, to hear those who try and make that claim explain more about what they mean, because I just don't see how they can defend it. Yeah. Well, can I comment on that? Because yeah, of course, being a, having been reformed and, and whatnot, what the reformed are going to say is basically what Augustine's conception was of the predestined. So the, the invisible church is made up of those who were unconditionally elected in the divine decree. So basically they're starting with soteriology or actually starting with the divine decree 
rather than starting their theology with the divine triad and the persons of the, the persons and uh, uh, and Christology kind of laying the groundwork in the order of theology, Calvinists begin with the divine decree and soteriology as kind of an outworking of the Augustinian notion of predestination. So they they very heavily rely on that approach, which makes the church essentially something that's strictly only the invisible elect known to God from the foundation of the world. So that's how they're going to argue that in every generation there were true Christians amongst the different sects. And ultimately only God knows that because God knows the secret elect. And those are those are the ones that God foreknew before the foundation of the world. So that's the invisible church, which kind of exists amongst all the different sects. And I think that the motivation for Calvin to do this out of Augustine was to try to explain his ecclesiology, given the predominance of, you know, in the West, papalism and Catholicism for the last, uh, you know, several 1500 years. So, so Calvin is saying, well, I'll rely on the Augustinian notion of predestination as the, what constitutes the invisible church to explain what's been happening for the last 1500 years. One of the uh, passages from St. Augustine's writings that, uh, uh, Calvin and other Protestants have used to argue for an invisible church is I believe it was a commentary on or a sermon on John 10 where you you have you know Christ the good shepherd who knows his sheep but it, towards the end of that it talks about uh, and other sheep I have which are not of this fold but then it says and there shall be one fold and one shepherd but um, what they what they they'll they'll quote him as saying many are the wolves within and many are the sheep without. So in other words, there are wolves within the church and there are sheep outside of the church. But if you keep reading the quote, he says, you know, many are the sheep without that will yet be part of the church. Mm -hmm. And many are the wolves within that will yet be outside of the church. <laughs> so he said, you, you cannot get from St. Augustine's writing some idea that outside of the Catholic church, there were other sects yeah. that had true believers that were functioning as part of the church, independent of the, of the Catholic church. You, you, you have to totally ignore everything he says uh, to come to that kind of a conclusion, but it fits, you know, when you're a Protestant at the, in the early days of the Reformation, you already have hundreds of different Protestant sects that have broken into pieces and can't agree on basic things like what is the Eucharist you have to come up with some way to explain how people can still be part of the church and yet be separated from each other. So that's, that's where this all comes from, but you, they claim it comes from Augustine, but it really doesn't. Yeah, that's a great point. I didn't mean to, I don't want to give the impression that he taught that Calvin was saying, well, can I find a patristic idea that I can kind of build on? And it was the Augustinian doctrine of predestination, but uh, father John Weber is absolutely correct. That Augustine was very clear that, the visible body, I mean, he believed in baptismal regeneration. So the vi visible body of the Catholic church, which he was a bishop in, right? Um, all of the elect in his view would eventually be brought to that church. So you wouldn't have people that are Buddhists or, uh, you know, even amongst the Donatists, mm -hmm. right? Augustine believes that if he died as a Donatist, you would be dying outside the grace of the, of the one true Catholic church. So he's very strict about, uh, you know, extra ecclesium nulla salus to, to use the Latin terminology. Um, and Calvin has, but like Father John Wiper said, Calvin had to kind of develop that, like, well, I'm not going to agree with Augustine's, you know, uh, high church episcopacy stuff. So I'm going to take that to say that, you know, there's, there's elect amongst all the different so-called Christian groups. Josh, is there anything that you would like to add, uh, before we move on to the final question? Uh, it's kind of a two-part question and then we can jump into, uh, our audience questions after that. No, no, not not anything that I think is worth uh, spending the the limited time we have left on. I think we should just jump on. Okay, all right. So the last question I have for y'all, and uh, and this was so Dane. I, I originally asked Dane to be here uh, for this. I uh, last minute thing came up with him, and so me and him was kind of working on this question uh, together. And so it's in two parts. So I'll ask the first part, let you guys go through it, and then I'll ask the second part. Uh, but in Father Thomas Hopko's uh, four volume series, the Orthodox Faith. He says this, he says, quote, the canons of the church are distinguished first between those of a dogmatic or doctrinal nature and those of a practical, ethical and structural character. 
they are then further distinguished between those which may be changed and altered and those which are unchangeable and may not be altered under any conditions, end quote. So the first question I have is, how can we distinguish between which canons are binding or unchangeable and which can be changed over time and who makes that decision exactly? I'd like to jump in because I was in Father Tom's dogmatics class when he said that. And yeah. uh, we, we talked about it. Uh, not only the example given, but uh, we, we talked about the, the, the canons, for example, that forbid a priest from going to the circus or from going to the theater. Now, a thousand years ago, what the circus was and what the theater was were very different than what Ringling Brothers and Broadway is today. <laughs> sure. Although some might argue on Broadway, probably not. But um, the, the fact of the matter is you you had sort of the, the structure and administrative part and the faith and morals part. And the, the latter, the, these things about the priest going or not going to this place or that place was an example of the faith and morals part. Priests didn't want to be in, in the circus where people were getting killed. People, uh, priests shouldn't be seen at the theater where there was nudity and foul language and stuff like that. This was just considered to be uh, untoward, to use a, a word that I like and is not very popular anymore. It was untoward to see priests in places like that. Mm. Um, but the other things that, that, that the other kind of canons that we have, uh, you need three people to ordain a bishop. Why? Because you want to give a confirmation that the faith of the candidate matches the faith that the other bishops know to be the faith that they received and have taught and are passing on and things like that. There, there, were, there was a witness component, for example, to that. Um, the, the other examples of of canons that may no longer apply, um, again, a, a man has to be 30 years old when he's ordained, or at least 30 years old. People kind of talk about that when they don't talk about the one that says he should be married for at least three years if he's already married. Mm. So there, there's a lot of things that, that are for good order and administration, and there are a lot of things that have to do with um, really, quite frankly, not scandalizing the faithful. Okay. regarding the, the the faith and the morals and the activity of, of, of clergy and people like that. So um, uh, there there are just some things that aren't going to change. Now, when some people say, well, what about the the strictures about, about marriage mm -hmm. um, between a man mm -hmm. and a woman? And so couldn't those change because, well, we're all broad-minded now and we think, you know, all of the, the way we think and so forth. Well, fornication is still fornication no matter who's doing it. Homosexual fornication is still going to be homosexual fornication no matter uh, who's doing it. So you can't marry two people because marriage is a divine institution that dates back to Genesis and so forth. And you're never going to change the strictures on homosexual or heterosexual fornication as being something that can be good. Because even though society may think otherwise, the Bible doesn't teach otherwise. Gotcha. And the church is never taught otherwise. Right on. And that, and that was part of the, the, the second part of the question. Uh, you know, what, what let's say in a hundred years from now, if an overwhelming majority of the church clergy and laity would want to change that, right. It, it can't be changed because it sounds like what you're saying is that this is founded. That's, that's a concept that's founded in the scriptures themselves and good luck changing the scriptures at that point. Right. Well, uh, well, well, exactly. I, I mean, I, I know the Orthodox Church in America would never change its teachings on those. I'm not sure about Rocor, but I know that we would never do anything like that. <laughs> Father John, what, what would you say in response to that? <laughs> well, we believe that the ecumenical councils and the councils that they endorsed, that so that, which therefore have ecumenical weight, are infallible. And so there's no canon that we would say that you could just blow off, okay. but there are canons that are referring to time and, and uh, conditioned uh, specific things. And so one popular canon that people like to quote to argue, well, we can blow off the canons is there is a canon that says that you can't go to a Jewish doctor, but what what they're ignoring is the fact that at that time there was no such thing as secular medicine. So we're not talking about going to Dr. Shapiro, who's got an MD from a medical school and just practicing secular medicine. They're talking about going to some uh, Jewish faith healer who used, you know, herbal remedies as well, but it was not an, it, his, the, the Jewish religion was connected to what they were doing. And so the canons are saying, you can't do that because you're you're crossing the lines and you're 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 mixing uh 
Christianity with Judaism by doing that. So, so it's, it does, the canon doesn't mean what a lot of people try to make it to mean, but even canons that have, that address things that are no longer directly applicable in our current time still have principles that you could apply. And, and you find the same thing in scripture. There are things in the scriptures that address things that don't exist today, but we don't say, well, let's take that out of the Bible. Uh, what we say is let's understand what, what, what it really meant and, and how we can apply it because there's some application that we can make. All scripture is profitable. We're told by St. Paul, well, all the canons are profitable too, but they're all not meant to be taken in a woodenly literalistic way uh, and without, you know, paying attention to the context that the canon was actually addressing. Right. And, and Jay, same, same question. I, I don't have much to add. I think they uh, both of the fathers said that very well. And uh, yeah. canons are not really, that's, that's not my, my area. I don't know a lot about them. So, okay. but yeah. by the way, one more thing. And, and, and yeah, Father, John is, Father John is completely right about what he said. I just want to add one more thing, and because Father Hopko, as a matter of fact, mentioned this when we were talking about that that canon about the Jewish doctors, that not only was it a certain kind of medicine, but they were proselytizing Christians big time, and and Christians were told, look, you know, you don't need to have your faith assaulted, questioned, or anything like that. Stay away from them because that's what's going to happen if you go there. So there were there was that. If, I guess you could say that there's sort of a practicality there in the church then saying to her children, don't do this because if you do it, you could be bothered, you could be challenged, you could be tempted. Mm -hmm. uh, this could be a trial you don't want to or need to go into, so stay away from Jewish doctors. So the, 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 there's a reason a lot of canons were, were written and usually it was to address something that was happening right then and there or had been happening. And, and if it's not happening anymore, then maybe we can go to Ringling Brothers or maybe we can go to Broadway or maybe we can go see Dr. Shapiro. Um, but so so you, you, you have this 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 situation today where people are going to question, well, I wonder if these things are still applicable. Right. Well, the, the faith and moral stuff is, isn't going to change. You know, uh, uh, when we talk about gay marriage or something like that, that's, just, you know, abortion is just never going to change. All, all these things that have been what they have been for 1500, 2000 years or more are still going to be that way 100 years from now or more. Right. And that the church's challenge and the, and the faithful in the church, their challenge is to be faithful what has been passed down to them. Right. Now, what the pro LGBTQ people uh, will 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 try to argue and re there's a video that just was put out by Fordham like in the last couple days where you have panel discussion where they're actually promoting this idea that somehow we, we might yet be able to have gay marriage in the church. And, uh, and, and essentially what they try to argue is, well, the kind of homosexuality that's condemned in scripture is not the kind of homosexuality that we have today. And that is just total nonsense. And, and the commandment that you have in Leviticus, where it says a man shall not lie with another man as with a woman, it's an mm -hmm. abomination. You could you could hardly get a more broad brushed description of homosexual sex than that, because it's not saying anything about a different power dynamic or, you know, a, a slave master versus slave relationship or abusive relationship is just saying you can't lie with another man as with a woman it's an abomination and as a matter of fact the word the words in greek uh from that text in the septuagint were made into a word which there's also a hebrew equivalent that's also taken from the hebrew text right. but the arsenikoiti Mm -hmm. it, it, arsen man quite lie and so so to lie with a man this, these words were put together to make a new word which refers to homosexuality and and so that, that's what saint paul is condemning in first corinthians chapter six i believe uh nine through eleven if i'm remembering correctly and uh, and he says people who do that are not going to inherit the kingdom of god and he also talks about um the uh Oh, what's the, what's the word for, the, for, for it's translated as effeminate in the King James, but, but, but I, I, the Greek word is escaping me at the moment, but basically it's talking about men who would feminize themselves so as to have sex with other men, like temp, you know, temple prostitutes, uh, male prostitutes of various kinds. 
And so that would be sort of the rough equivalent of transgenderism that you have today. But but the condemnation of uh, the Arsenikiti or Arsenikoitai, if you're doing the Erasmian pronunciation, mm-hmm. is is about as broad brushed of a condemnation of his homosexuality as it gets. And so you have to come up with a, a, a fantasy history. You have to rewrite history and just ignore the actual facts to try to say, well, the canons aren't really addressing what we're talking about, so therefore this is okay. But that's what they're trying to, to argue. And a great book on this subject's not an Orthodox author, but it's the Bible and homosexual practice. Okay. And uh, th- this book gives a very thorough discussion of the biblical texts, the extra biblical texts, and even the, what the fathers have to say about homosexuality. And, and it takes on these kinds of arguments piece by piece and just shows how they're they're just made up um, bull crap that you know that 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 it's the only way they can promote this kind of stuff contrary to two thousand years of Christian tradition and a couple more thousand years of uh, biblical tradition. Right, I appreciate that absolutely, absolutely. All right, guys, let's uh, let's jump into the Q and A. But before we do that, and and so let me just talk to the audience for just a second, um, and then I want to ask you guys one more question, uh, and then we can do that. If you all have a question. Uh, for any of the panel, uh, Jay, Father John, or Father Jonathan, please put uh, it in the live chat. If you would, put at Faith Unaltered before and address who your question is to, and we'll get to them uh, here momentarily, probably about another five, ten minutes. And then um, Super Chats will take priority over just regular questions that are asked. And so uh, with that being said, the last question, and I like doing this because uh, obviously Josh, myself, uh, Dane, all, all of the team at Faith and Altered were not infallible and we might miss things and so is there anything that we haven't addressed that y'all think is key in this conversation especially talking about normative authority apostolic succession whenever it comes to this conversation in general or if we're debating this topic with protestants or roman catholics is there anything that we missed that you guys feel is key uh now would be the time to bring it up and we'll start with father jonathan ivanoff uh go to father john whiteford and then we'll end with jay and then jump into the audience q a uh, it's my impression at this point we've covered quite a bit. Okay. Father John? Yeah, I can't think of anything offhand. Okay. And Jay? No, I'm good. All right. All right. Right on, guys. So this has been, I, I've enjoyed this conversation. Uh, this has been really, really fun. And so we'll start with the uh, Super Chats. Uh, Mitch Murphy, $10. Thank you for that. Uh, I was told in catechism that layman, and I'm going to assume he meant should not say but he has should here, uh, but should not say, God bless you, because only clergy have the authority to give blessings. We should say, may God bless you. Curious of your thoughts on this. And anybody that wants to jump on that. Go well, it's, it's not correct. Now, if you're in the presence of a priest, you, a layman shouldn't be blessing the priest, but it's a pious custom that you know, I have a, a man in my parish who's actually from Russian aristocratic uh, lineage, and uh, and uh, I was in his home one time when one of his daughters was getting ready to go to work, and uh, and she held her hand, you know, making the sign of the cross the same way a layman makes the sign of the cross, but made the sign of the cross over her father. Mm-hmm. and blessed him and then he did the same thing for her and then they gave each other a kiss and she went to work so for a father to bless his children or even for children to bless their parents um th- this is totally acceptable and if you don't have a priest present you can do that over your food when you when you are blessing the food so that's that's uh, allowable okay uh father jonathan um, I, I, we, we live in a culture where everything says, God bless you. And, and I think our people are kind of, um, surrounded by this and perhaps influenced by this. Uh, it does say in the scriptures that the lesser does not bless the greater, for example, but then you have all kinds of, of, of exclamations in the Psalms and elsewhere. We, we bless you in the name of the Lord. So I, I, I think, um, while clergy give blessings and, 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 bishops give blessings uh deacons obviously don't lady really don't they they can do what father john said i've encountered that before and read about that before um but to, to take his strictly his question i was told in catechism that layman should not say god bless you assuming that was what he meant because only clergy have the authority to give blessings um 
but Father John gave a context. You know, your, your, your food, your children, things like that, where there is an established Orthodox tradition in that particular area. Uh, laymen shouldn't be say, saying God bless you to, 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 to clergy, but there, there are situations where they can, they can bless, in, in, you know, using their, their, their sign of the cross, where they can do certain blessings. And this is known to us for a long time. And Jay. No, I don't, I don't have anything to add to that. Okay. Right on. Thank you. Again. In, in Russian, actually, when they say thank you, they're, they're literally, it's a, it's a contraction of uh, Spasi Bog, which means God save you. And, uh, huh. and, and Greeks often will say to, to other people, you know, when, when they're, when they're greeting them, which means to give a, they're asking for a blessing. So it's, it, it, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but it's just that I would never, you know, say God bless you to my bishop because my bishop is the one that blesses me. <laughs> right. But uh, but if my bishop's not around, I give blessings. And if I was a layman and my priest wasn't around, I would feel free to give blessings to other people too. I, and you and, certainly wish blessings upon other people. Sure. And that was a thing, you know, with me as a Protestant, you know, convert. The the first time I ever heard my priest say, you know, God bless you, it was just automatic. Well, God bless you too, you know. And then we had this conversation as well. And so, okay, right on, right on. Uh, the next uh, super chat, and again, thank you, Mitch, for the ten uh, dollars. We appreciate that. Uh, the next uh, is from Boethium. I'm assuming this is how you pronounce that. Uh, Protestant, uh, five dollars. Thank you for that. Uh, Protestant inquirer here: Why does the Protestant paradigm still fail, even if they acknowledge apostolic tradition and church authority? Love the channel. Thanks. Oh, for crying out loud, if they acknowledged apostolic tradition and church authority, they'd be orthodox. <laughs> how, how can you acknowledge either or both and not be in the orthodox church? You're acknowledging the authority of the apostles. You're acknowledging what they taught. You're acknowledging the structure, the church that they set up and, and so forth and so on. I, that, you can't divorce one from the other. You're either in the church or you're not. You either accept the church or you don't. And uh, I, I, I understand what Boethium, I understand what you're asking, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the Protestant paradigm is always going to fail because they may acknowledge bits and pieces of it, but they can never acknowledge the whole thing because we are the whole thing and they can't acknowledge us. And that's the problem. When I was a Protestant, I came to the point where I could acknowledge apostolic tradition and church authority, but that's when I decided I could no longer be a Protestant. <laughs> that's when I, I had to make the move. Uh, but there's no way to stay a Protestant and to recognize things like what St. Ignatius says in his epistles about no church not having priests, bishop, bishops, priests, and deacons can be called a church, uh, that the Eucharist is the true body and blood of Christ, that where the bishop is there is the Catholic church. You just can't stay a Protestant. And especially no one who follows another into a schism will inherit the kingdom of God. There's no way to be a Protestant and believe that <laughs> because Protestantism is one schism after another. Right. And, you know, and I'm glad you mentioned that, uh, Father John, because exactly what you just said, I was listening to, you know, some of Jay's episodes like early on. Uh, I think this was whenever I was still even in a choir. And that very thing that you guys were talking about was, you know, comparing different uh, like so Protestants, uh, Roman, you know, Roman Catholics now and then the Eastern Orthodox Church to the early church fathers and just seeing the similarities between what the early church fathers said and how the Orthodox Church uh, structures and has continued this pattern, you know, all throughout the ages. I mean, not and not only the early church fathers, but you get into the medieval fathers and then even modern fathers today. It's the same thing, it seems like to me anyway. And so that was the thing. I mean, orthodoxy really just kind of landed on my lap. I had a friend, uh, Joshua Sherman, that had converted at this time. And this was about the time that I had uh, really started questioning and might have even left Calvinism. And I was kind of like a kid without a home. And Josh was like, well, why don't you examine, you know, Orthodox, Eastern Orthodoxy? I never heard of it before. And so and I started listening to Jay. And that was the thing that you had mentioned to do is just really compare and contrast what the early church taught to what modern, uh, you know, uh, Christendom, uh, Roman Catholics, Protestants and Eastern Orthodoxy teach now. And that was the thing that landed me in the Orthodox Church, uh, to be honest with you guys. And so uh, with that being said, Jay, is there anything that you'd like to add? 
Yeah, I remember going through that kind of phase when I was a Calvinist and uh, sort of reading the Church Fathers, and then I kind of went through the phase where I thought, well, maybe I can kind of make the Church Fathers have a kind of a level of, of status, and mm-hmm. I can appreciate them, I can give them, you know, verbal credence. I think the more that you dive into what they actually teach, that becomes more and more difficult if you if you hold to the solas of the classical Reformation, because right. there's not really any of the solas of the classical reformers in the Church Fathers. So, you know, I was kind of at this point where we were talking about Anabaptists. You, you either got, with, got to go with this blackout model or figure out some way in which, okay, well, I'm going to have to broaden my conception of what a Christian is to, uh, you know, be more than the solas, you know. And I think that if you listen to the chat that we had yesterday with uh, Redeem Zoomer, he's kind of in that situation where he's saying, well, maybe, maybe the, you know, I can give a lot of credence to the apostolic church. Um, and the traditions of the, of the early church in Nicaea. But then it turns out, you know, when you look at what Nicaea is actually teaching, you know, they've got Episcopate, they've got virgins, they've got, uh, you know, yeah, real presence, sacrifice the Eucharist. <laughs> that's all in Metropolitans. That's all, you know, that's all in the canons of, of Nicaea. So then you start to realize, okay, well, I'm not really in line with Nicaea. So I just think it's, it takes time to realize uh, the difference there. Right on, right on. Uh, so our next uh, super chat is from uh, same guy and uh, Boethium. What is a reasonable amount of certainty before joining the Orthodox Church? Do I need to be convinced of an arbitrary number of historical data points, number of doctrines, etc.? Um, how would you guys answer that, Father John? Uh, we'll start with you. I, th- I think when you get to the point where you can trust the church. It, it, when I talk, when I've talked to people who've converted, I I almost always hear them say the same thing that I came to, which is that I got to the point where I could trust the church, and so therefore I didn't need to keep proving the church was right about everything. Um, and it's it's just like as I used the analogy earlier, you know, if you trust your wife, you don't have to you know have her prove everything that she tells you. But you know the the church is is an infallible. Uh, uh, entity, and so therefore, you once you realize what the church is, you know that you can infallibly rely on everything that the church teaches. Mm-hmm. And Jay, yeah, I would agree with that. I, I think uh, it might differ from individual to individual depending upon you know what your interests are. It, for me, it took a really long time because I was kind of obsessed with you know solving every theological <laughs> issue. Um, so that for me, you know, made me hesitate and I, I took a really long time about 10 years of you know yeah. looking into orthodoxy before i finally made a decision um so it might differ person to person but i think father john's co- wife is correct i gonna say jay you you had said on a previous video that i think your catechumen it took 10 years you were 10-year catechumen is right that how well, you it? I, I mean I had, a, I had a wild course i mean in 2007 uh, yeah. you know, i went through the catechumen and didn't join the church for various reasons i mean i was mm-hmm. still super Thomas and I had all this, you know, medieval scholastic stuff that I was all kind of obsessed with. And and I think in some people's case, it does take time. It depends on your background. Right? So if you're really yeah. into that stuff, it's going to take a while before you kind of massage that out of your thinking process. It doesn't happen overnight. You don't immediately just kind of switch right. over to um, the differences between orthodoxy and Thomism. It just kind of it takes a while for that to work itself out of you. Or mm-hmm. for God to work it out of you, you know what I mean. So there might be situations where, um, you know, because sometimes I've seen people convert right away, and then they they let's say you're they're Roman Catholic, and they think, well, I'm just going to go right to this Western right stuff. And they go mm-hmm. right to the Western right, which I'm not saying that's all bad, but they don't get like a good catechesis in the Eastern Fathers, mm-hmm. and so then they want to say, well, I don't care about this essence energy stuff. That doesn't matter to me. I don't. And then that in, then they ends up they end up going back to uniatism or something like that. So mm-hmm. there's a danger, I think, in uh, if you do it too quick in some cases, right, mm-hmm. where you will it'll be worse than if you had taken your time. Is what I'm trying to say. Right. No, but I, I agree. can't say who that. Well, I can't say what that is for any individual. They have to work that out. What's their situation? Right. Right. And then, that, Father, Tyler, let me let me jump in here. This is this yeah, of is course. A, uh, uh, this is a question I'm, I'm greatly interested in. Uh, yep. I'm, I'm sorry I had to step out for a moment. I didn't hear Father John's answer, but uh, so if I repeat anything he said, forgive me. Uh, one of the things I I tell 
my inquirers and teach my catechumens is that the Orthodox Church exists to bring us into the presence of God and to join us to him. And that if you go to an Orthodox Church as, as an inquirer and you're trying to figure out whether I should join this or not, just keep in mind that if you go to an Orthodox service, you get a, a little taste of what it is you're in for. And if you feel in that Orthodox service that you may have come in the first time of your in your life into the presence of God himself, that you can feel him, that you can feel the glory, that you can feel what the Russian emissaries felt when they went to Hagia Sophia. We did not know whether we were in heaven or on earth, but one thing is for sure, God dwells there among men. If you feel that, then you're pretty certain at that point that you're in the right place. Because how many uh, converts come to orthodoxy, and that's one of the things they talk about. I felt close to God for the first time in my life, something like that. Now, there's obviously stuff you got to believe in, but in terms of a certainty, I'd say that's one of, that's really high on my list. One thing I do with uh, people who are interested in being made catechumens in the, in the Russian church abroad, we baptize almost everybody unless the bishop gives us a blessing to do something different. But in the Hapgood service book, there are renunciations for different types of Protestants or Catholics or Monophysites, and then the affirmations that, that people who are converting to the faith are supposed to make. And I go over that with people before I'll even make them a catechumen to make sure that they're okay with those things. Because if they've read through those things and they're okay with it, I feel like, okay, now they're they're ready to make the next step and, and be made catechumens. Because basically when you're made a catechumen, you're like being engaged to the church. Mm -hmm. And th there's a lot of similarities between the, the catechumen baptism service with the betrothal and the wedding service. And they're not accidental similarities. And and so, but, but you don't get engaged with somebody just because you think that might not be a bad person. You, 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 you want to at least have some level of certainty that this is somebody that you really want to get married to before you take that step. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what I do to, to make sure people know what they're doing. Right on. Thank you for that. Good practical advice, guys. I, I appreciate that too. And taking that into consideration as I have not yet been baptized as well. And so, uh, but plan to be very, very soon. All right. So since we are doing an episode on normative authority in the church and apostolic succession, where we're talking about authority, I want to put this in practical and in, in just a practical situation. And so Josh, I'm going to delegate the authority that I have to you and see if you would be cool uh, with answering the last super chat live, or should we deal with this off of air? Um, I, I, to be honest with you, was interacting in the, the, the side chat a little bit and was trying to say mitigate the distraction. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, I think that the fact that he sent a super chat was just to try to get the attention out of there. Uh, and I don't think that he's necessarily asking a genuine question, but if, you know, he said, he sent a super chat, I, I don't think that it's wrong to honor that and bring it on screen, but I don't think that it's necessarily, uh, it's, it's more of a jest than it is a question. Okay, so let's do this then. Let's do this. Let's save that for last. And then okay. let's let's deal with the questions that are actually for this topic. And then we'll save that one for last. Okay. okay. So the so that's all the super chats except for that one. Um, but let's uh so we'll do a couple of these. Uh the transfigure life, our boy Luther. Uh what's up, Luther? Thanks for the uh question. Uh what is the flaw of the Roman Catholic view of normative authority? And then anybody that wants to to jump on that, go for it. My criticism would be that I think the tendency in the Roman Catholic system is to not just see the magisterium or the Pope as um, an action of exercising normative authority to bind people and to give them an ought, but sort sort more so turns over into kind of a worshiping of authority and i think that that's a that's a danger that's there if you read saint justin popovich in his book uh, uh life in christ he talks about the rise of european humanism and the papacy as kind of a manifestation of the european worship of man uh, and he talks about it in that way that it sort of ends up being what is intended perhaps to have been a pragmatic solution to things actually becomes a worship of authority and i don't think in in our view we worship authority itself i mean if god has authority we have authorities 
but authority doesn't kind of take on this sort of property of worshiping authority itself. So I think that's the danger in the Roman Catholic view is that it goes beyond just kind of saying that you got to submit to, you know, the church's understanding of Nicaea or the Cappadocian understanding of nice uh, of the triad or whatever at Constantinople one, it turns into a kind of a uh, overstepping boundaries of, of limits of authority where the Pope becomes a temporal ruler. He becomes, you see, I'm, you said it just kind of expands into all these other, you know, it's basically, if you've seen Dune, it's the Kwisatz Haderach. And I think that's just way out of, out of, out of bounds. Father John or Father Jonathan. I, th I think that that's basically it. I mean, it's the, the their their idea of of authority really revolves around the Pope, and uh, you know, and they they talk about the magisterium, but you essentially have the Pope opening up the door to blessing gay marriage in in uh, very recent history, and you've got Roman Catholic apologists that are having to trip all over themselves to find some way to say that well he's not really doing that he's only blessing a couple that happens to be gay <laughs> and uh uh but it, when when you have this idea that the pope is infallible and then he 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 becomes a heretic even by roman catholic standards they really have no means to correct that mm -hmm. um short of maybe giving him a, you know, a poisoned uh, meal or something like that. Uh, and and uh, whereas in the Orthodox Church, we don't have anybody like that. The, 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 the entire church can correct any one Aryan bishop or even group of bishops. And, uh, and so if, if, for example, you have in the ecumenical patriarchate today, certain bishops that are doing some crazy stuff, it's not the same problem for us that it is for the Roman Catholics that the Pope is doing crazy stuff because the ecumenical patriarch is not the Pope for us. And uh, we don't have an expectation that he's infallible or couldn't err. So if we see uh, that, that uh, there, there's errors arising from that particular patriarchate, we just say that that's, that's wrong. And if things continue in a certain direction, that might eventually result in in them being cut off from the rest of the church but uh but that's that's how we deal with it father jonathan anything else to add you're muted now this would not be my area of expertise go. so i'll pass on that okay all right uh let's go let's see here so i thought this one was actually really good uh because it's practical um, so this is two parts. So GUS, I'm in GoArch and struggling with many issues we see in that jurisdiction. I'm wrestling with leaving for another jurisdiction, but don't want to continue my Protestant tradition of church hopping. And then the second part is, how does this relate to normative authority? Would I need a release from my bishop to leave? Lady, don't need uh, releases. In ancient times, if you went to another parish, you would have to have a letter that showed that you were a, a Christian in good standing, but that's not something that's practiced currently. Um, what I would say is we're in one of those periods of history in the, in the history of the church where you have some gray area because you've got bishops that are erring, but they it's not reached the point where the rest of the church has cut them off. And, uh, and so... At this point, those bishops still remain bishops of the church, even though they're saying things that other bishops are, and uh, and people are are calling out. And the, the, ideally, we hope that they're corrected, that they correct themselves because they hear the rest of the church and they turn back from that, that going down that way. Um, but at some point, this could lead to a schism, but we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. So... I would say a lot would depend on where you're at and what your options are, but there are a lot of great priests in the Greek archdiocese that are very faithful men. And I don't have any doubt that if there is a schism down the road, that those uh, priests uh, will lead their flock to remain with the rest of the church. But if you had a priest who was promoting LGBTQ stuff, you know, I wouldn't hesitate to say, go, <laughs> don't, don't have anything to do with that church. And if you had to do reader services and drive, you know, 300 miles or 500 miles to church, maybe once a month or once a quarter, 
uh, because that was the nearest church that you could get to. That's just what you'd have to do. But, uh, but I wouldn't say that there, we can make a blanket statement that, that if you're in the Greek archdiocese is that you should just leave. It's, it's, it's a little bit more nuanced than that. Okay. And, and I think um, it, it also is going to relate to what are those reasons that, that the person is uncomfortable with. I don't like Byzantine chant. I don't like the, the incense. I don't like father sermons, the, the, you know, things right. like that. You know, th there is this concept in orthodoxy that you bloom where you're planted. And sometimes you you got to tough these things out as a, as a maybe as a trial because you could leave and go to another church thinking, oh, everything's going to be hunky dory there. And then the priest gets replaced. And you've got nothing more than a worse copy of the of the place you left or something like that. And then that priest leaves and another guy comes in and he's more conservative and more whatever. And you, and you would have liked them, but you left. So th this idea that I can I can hop around. I'm not a big fan of it. I understand what Father John said, and I, I kind of agree with it. unless he's preaching heresy or or something like that. Try and stick it out and help the parish you're in that God led you to and through which you found orthodoxy. Try and make it a better place. Mm hmm. There's a reason it seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Father Jonathan, but there's a reason that you're there to begin with, right? One would think. One would think. Fair enough. And then, Jay, is there anything that you'd like to add? No, I don't typically try to give advice on these types of topics. I, I just stick to my wheelhouse when it comes to the philosophical issues. And I don't really, I, I would just defer to the priests on that one. Fair enough. Fair enough. And so the last question we got, I, I know you can answer this one. Um, and and this is kind of the fun one. And so we'll end with this. But oh. GUS, Jay Dyer versus Kelly Powers <laughs> win. <laughs> I don't know who that is. Who's that? OK, we, so we've had Kelly on uh, a couple different times. Uh, I can send you uh, the, the videos that we did in an email. Uh, but Kelly, he runs Berean Perspective Apologetics. And he's I don't know. We so we engaged are you familiar with sean griffin by any chance mm -mm. okay so he runs a channel called kingdom in context where he talks about uh the father he was in the chat by the way sean was sean was earlier he was in the chat yeah really interesting mm -hmm. um so uh he promotes um this idea that god the father has a body that jesus is offering uh animal sacrifices to god in heaven at this point and uh, Kelly and I have addressed some of these things. Kelly's a Protestant, and so he's got a different understanding of the Trinity uh, than than we would. Uh, but that's that's kind of the the gist of of what G is asking, I think. So, I, I mean, I don't I don't know. Maybe maybe I, we have time for that. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, guys, I really appreciate it. Um, you have helped me again before this. Even uh, all three of you have been a really big part of my Orthodox experience. And uh, so I just wanted to offer each of you a thank you and that I really appreciate what you all are doing on your respective channels. And not only that, but coming on and engaging with me publicly and privately while I journey uh, into orthodoxy at this point. Um, I want to give you guys a chance before we uh, head out to plug your channels and, and plug the content uh, that you guys are doing right now. And so we'll start with Father Jonathan Ivanov. I know you have the Transfigured Life. And so go ahead and plug your channel. And what what is the next thing? I know you said that you were releasing an episode with Perry. Um, what, what do you guys got planned after that? Well, we've got a, a, a three-episode um, uh, time with Perry because the, the, the time we spent uh, in, in recording these, these sessions was, was about three hours or maybe a little bit more. So we're going we're gonna to break that up into three episodes. Um, but we've got some personal testimony stuff coming up. We just finished a nice one with uh, Father Christopher Foley and Father James Bozeman, who, who were in a punk rock band back in the 90s called Luxury. Uh, there was a, a, a an accident that, you know, kind of changed their lives. And uh, those two, uh, James's brother, Father David in Texas, and now a fourth member of that um, of that incident, uh, have all become Orthodox clergy. So it's a it's a fascinating uh, discussion we have. It's follow up to, a I think, an NPR produced documentary called Parallel Love, the, the story of a band called Luxury. Uh, mm -hmm. So we just finished that. We got Perry and then we've got some other things that um Luther and I are going to do talking about faith and works and, and some other things that uh, relate directly to uh, Protestant teachings today. But we got some good stuff coming up on The Transfigured Life. Look for us. Right on. Father John Wyford, go ahead and plug. I know you are you're still doing things with Ancient Faith Radio. I know you're I, I've got your podcast linked uh, in the description. Uh, but where can uh, people find you 
uh, other than that? And then uh, what do you have uh, planned for the upcoming months? Uh, you're muted, sir. Let's see, can we unmute? Ah, Father John, uh, you're muted. Sorry about there you that. Go. No, you're good. My, uh, uh, if you go to St. Jonah, St. spelled out, uh, Jonah.org, you can find uh, links to my articles as well as my sermons. Okay. And uh, I have sermons. My sermons are posted on my website. And then uh, most of them are also posted on Ancient Faith Radio. And then uh, my blog is father spelled out dot John. Uh, or actually father John's dot, dot uh, blogspot dot com. But if you just Google my name, you'll find that stuff. Okay. And, and as far uh, as in the future, yeah. I'm always working on the liturgical calendar. I've I, the 2024 liturgical calendar is coming out soon. It's already been, <laughs> you know, my part of it's done. And I'm always now starting to work on 2025. So that's always in the works. And I'm always writing new articles and they have new articles planned. I just need to find time to do it. Right on. Right on. Tyler, he had to mute himself because he was hurling anathemas at you, and we just can't have that in <laughs> public discourse at all. So. Right, 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 right. Uh, and Jay, um, I've got your website linked in, uh, in the description, uh, but what are your plans for the next upcoming months? What are you guys getting ready to dig into? Um, well, I think we the most relevant to today's discussion was probably the chat that we had uh, yesterday with uh, the young guy that's a popular Calvinist. Mm -hmm on uh, youtube uh, redeem zoomer we had a three-hour conversation com contrasting orthodox and calvinist theology and uh, dr branson was just on a couple nights ago as well and we did a really long discussion of uh the doctrine the monarchy of the father and the energies and the filioque and all that and in his responses to unitarianism so actually that conversation that we we had is very relevant to the earlier question that you had today about uh, unitarianism and so those are over on my youtube channel i would say those are the most relevant to to what we were talking about today right on right on. and uh jay just real quick after uh, so after i played the outro video can you hang out for a second i got a question for you for who me for you yeah uh-huh okay all right cool i appreciate it all right josh any final closing words um just that i am super pleased as always to to not only be a part of these conversations but to to you know be in association and be able to network with some of you fine gentlemen this has been fantastic uh, I'm, I, I, I'm hoping that we can do this again because I always enjoy being able to have conversations like this and just listen because you guys are really, really intelligent, very prepared. I just am, I, I'm, I'm happy to be here to be honest with you, but to be able to interact with you guys like this is a real privilege. And so thank you for your time. This is awesome. Yeah. And same, I just want to reiterate, I had a enjoyable time listening you know while josh was asking his questions and then not only that but listening to the answers that you guys gave uh and so i am pleased as well with how this went and i look forward to having each and every one of you back uh at a, at a point in the future maybe even before my conversion or if not definitely after and so i'd love to talk to you guys more but with that being said uh, we've got a whole host of things coming up uh, we've got the hundred dollar giveaway watch josh shave his head uh, because we hit our 2000 subscriber mark, our goal by the end of the year, uh, we did that. And so we're going to uh, do a live stream, a special live stream on November the 3rd at 7 p.m. where we give away 100 bucks uh, to one of our subscribers that are present at the uh, at the live stream that are watching it. And then, like I said, uh, Emily, Josh's lovely wife, will uh, shave his head uh, for that. And then also we've got uh, a couple different episodes coming up uh, at the end of the month here. Uh, we've got a uh, Roman Catholic um, self-proclaimed exorcist, uh, Father, uh, I forget his first name, Angelakis. Um, David is bringing him on to discuss exorcisms and, and things of that nature for Halloween. And then I think, if I'm not mistaken, we've got a um, uh, someone who was caught up into the transgender movement that has detransitioned now, uh, has found Christ, and uh, is yeah that's a that's an interesting story but uh i think we're going to bring her on uh to discuss her what exactly happened with her personally during the time of transition 
and then detransitioning out of that movement. So I think that that's going to be a really good episode, uh, practical uh, speaking. But other than that, y'all, uh, we've got a whole host of stuff planned. Um, with that, uh, Josh has got his new segment on Faith Unaltered entitled The Cosmic Corner. We've got Three Crowns where we discuss the Trinity and argue with Unitarians. So that's fun. Uh, but we thank, like I said, I thank each and every one of you guys for coming on. And we will see you next time. Good night. God bless and stay like.